Welcome back. It's the Big Blue Banter, New York Giants football podcast. I'm Dan Schneier. Joined as always, my co-host, Nick Filato. Tonight, we're here to break down the Giants all 22 coaches film of the offense against the Seattle Seahawks defense in week eight. Lost for the Giants, their first loss in five games. We told you a little while ago, and for those of you who've been here for a while, you know, we don't sugarcoat these things. We're not fans per se. We are fans, huge fans of this team. I think that's clear in all our content, but we're not like just fans. We try to be analysts first, fans second. So there's bad film. We're not just going to hide it. We're not just going to not talk about it. We're not going to, we're not going to just not break it down and only point to some of the good things. We got to break it all down. And to be honest, this offense was bad on film. They were fooled. They were, uh, I'm sorry, they did not fool the Seahawks in the run game and with the things that they've liked to do in the past that's worked for them for a while now, so I don't blame them. They, in my mind, went back to some old ways, you know, and by old ways, Nick, I mean Judge Joe Judge, Jason Garrett ways of running the ball a lot on second and long, running the ball a lot on first down. Reasons being, that's what I want to get into with you on after we review the tape, Nick, because I don't know if they feel like they can do anything else, and that's the scary part because... I don't know that Kafka and Dave will want to be this team and this play caller duo that runs a lot on second and long, the worst down to run on and runs a lot on first and 10, which is not a terrible down to run on, but not exactly ideal. Um, So we'll get into a lot of that. There were issues with just about everything in this game when it comes to the (laughs) offensive side of the ball. Very few. I mean, you could say not everything. Andrew Thomas was phenomenal again. And we'll get into some of that because this dude is just, I think he has like nine total pressures allowed on the season, maybe 10 through what, eight games has not allowed a sack yet. The one he allowed got called back by penalty. I think one quarterback hit. So he was phenomenal in this game. Barkley was pretty damn good. Slayton was pretty damn good, but the rest of the giants offense really sputtered in this one. And so let's dive into all that, Nick. But before we dive into that, I want to kind of get a feel from you of what you thought maybe after watching the film or any, any quick overall thoughts before we dive into the tape and, And just how the Seahawks, uh, I guess, tried to counter schematically what the Giants wanted to do. Absolutely. So first off, I want to just start with a little bit of some observations, I guess. Sure. This team desperately missed Daniel Bellinger, which says a lot about Daniel Bellinger as a prospect and also says a lot about this current offense. If We're just going to kind of call a spade a spade. This is a rookie day three pick and the drop off from Daniel Bellinger to Tanner Hudson as a blocker. It's substantial. And it was showed the entire game. And I got to say, man, so much credit to the Seattle Seahawks. The Giants kept trying to do their misdirection and their counter game. Seattle just trusted their run keys. Whenever that sniffer from the backside pulled, the linebackers, they shifted, and they all just keyed into the run. And any time that the Giants tried to run a misdirection off that, which will go over the film, it never freaking worked. The misdirection in the counter game just didn't work at all because, Dan, how many times was Seattle's second level defenders out of position? Can't really think. Definitely no more than a handful, if at most. If at most. I don't, yeah. I don't even think I really think of any play. Yeah. They were always in position. Like the Giants rushing attack wasn't fooled at, or the Giants rushing attack did not fool the Seattle Seahawks. We got that same uh, cadence wrong. We were, we were trying to say they didn't fool them, but we said they weren't fooled. But yeah, yeah I know what you're saying. It, they, the Giants all run offense. You can't get that going and then you can't work the play action pass. And this is the byproduct of that, a stagnant offense that can't throw the football down the field. And the craziest part about it is there were plays to be had down the field. And that's why it's kind of weird. And I don't know why Daniel Jones didn't pull the trigger on some of those plays, but I do want to tip my cap to Seattle. They ran just a lot of cover six, a lot of cover three, not necessarily coverages that aren't ubiquitous around the NFL, but for whatever reason, the Giants couldn't do anything to attack them through the sky. And it wasn't just because Giants wide receivers aren't creating separation. Yes, that's one issue, but there are many other issues with this offense right now. Yeah, there are many other issues. And, you know, we'll call spade a spade. We'll, we'll, we'll go over it and you guys will see it on the tape. I hope you can all take it in. You'll make your own observations. And I, I respect that, honestly, but you know, you can see for yourself, there were a lot of times where, and I don't know what happened in this game. I think, you know, a great observation, shout out to John. I don't want to mispronounce his name. And I, and I I tried to do it before the podcast. Um, Darienzo, I think is his name, John Darienzo, uh, listener of the podcast, one of our good, our, our, you know, good friends who's been here for a while. He made a good observation. He was actually at the game. So he went there and he basically said, did you notice how out of, you know, how how the get off from off the line of scrimmage from the Giants offensive line was out of unison, 
he's like the crowd noise really ha- was prohibitive. And he's like, you'll never understand until you're actually there in that stadium. And I think that was a great take by him because I did feel like the Giants offensive line was discombobulated in the run game. They weren't getting off the snap at the same time as you do constantly, as we'll show you, is just looking back and then and, and forward. And he does this weird thing with his hand. I'll show you a bunch on film, which I, I know. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Like, I don't know what that is, but he does that right before he like kind of pushes it forward. I'm not sure what he's indicating because it's not to anyone. But yeah, that timing could be an issue. And as far as the crowd goes and just the noise of it, all the penalties we already discussed in the reaction pod and the get off the line of scrimmage, I think some of that had an impact on Daniel Jones. Daniel Jones did not have a good football game. We're going to get to it in this game. He made a couple really good throws for sure. He didn't have too much, you know, too many opportunities, but he left a lot of throws on the field. A lot being, and look, it's only a handful, but in a game like this, with a team like this, a handful of throws is everything. You know, the Giants are not a high octane offense that has that can give up a, a few throws here and there, or a handful of throws in a game and be fine. They're an offense that needs to capitalize on any separation opportunity that they have. And there were multiple separation opportunities they left on the field um, for reasons I don't know, including one in the red zone and then one for what could have been a long touchdown pass. A second, which we'll go over, which may have also been. So it wasn't his best game. I felt like he was a little bit less. I guess comfortable in the pocket, but again, part of that could just be the crowd noise and the impact that it had on the entire game. So it's hard to really tell from the the film what kind of impact the crowd had, but it felt like the entire offense was thrown off a bit by it. Definitely was thrown off a bit. And I got to say something else about, we talked about Seattle's discipline, just reading the run, but also man, their run pass keys on the play action passes. I just felt like every time the giants decided to run a play action pass, Seattle knew exactly what they were. It was crazy. They were so dialed in to the Giants' tendencies and just like the little nuances of seeing how an offensive lineman is blocking. And that can kind of be a tell. Are you running or are you passing? And the only plays that can kind of be left up to be ambiguous are the RPO type plays because there's options to do both, which we saw a little bit of success early in the game. But I just feel like anything the Giants did offensively, Seattle had some sort of answer for it. And you could sit there and you could bash Kafka. And, you know, some blame should fall on Mike Kafka. But at the same time, Kafka had plays dialed up that were right there for the taking. And the Giants just didn't execute. And it's not all on Daniel Jones, definitely on Daniel Jones. But there are plenty of players on this offense who were not executing, whether it be Saquon Barkley could have this big run. Someone missed a block. I'm telling you that, like... Talked right. about the Daniel Bellinger loss. Like Chris Myrick, I think he's a good blocker, man. I like Chris Myrick. But you, when you want to run 12, 13 personnel, you need other tight ends who can block. You can't put Tanner Hudson out there. Tanner Hudson is just a wide receiver, yeah. essentially. He's a big wide receiver. A guy can't block worth a damn. I like I Cager. I saw Cager more, show more in the blocking game than Hudson, to be honest. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I like Cager too, but like he's still a former wide receiver. So that loss of Bellinger is going to be going to be really felt. But I got to say this about Cager, and then we'll get into the film, Dan. Guy can move, right? Oh, yeah. He can move really well in space. Yeah, I really liked his movement skills. So, And you know what the Giants do, too? They had two plays specifically designed for this dude. So it's something we might see coming out of the bye week if he's still here on the roster. Yeah, without a doubt. And like you said, I think he showed a little bit more as just a blocker, especially in space, his functionality. And yeah, this is not... We're, we're going to get to this film. We're not blaming this all on Jones or anywhere close. We're just simply critiquing a game that wasn't his best by any means. And, you know, and you'll see it on the film yourself. There were times he could have pulled the trigger and didn't. I don't know why he didn't. I think in general, Jones is a more hesitant quarterback than most that I've watched to throw downfield um, for whatever reason that is. Cause you know, when he does throw downfield, so it's typically pretty accurate and pretty solid. So I don't, I don't know. I think part of it is just, he wants to get to certain plays that are higher percentage. Like on one of the throws, it ends up being converted first down and we'll go over it, but it requires a broken tackle by the receiver on the play, the tight end, Myrick. And it was really shouldn't have been a first down. He just kind of missed the tackle defender. And it was kind of just a check down that usually doesn't work. Um, and so we'll go over it all. There's a lot to talk about here on the film from the offensive side of the ball. But let's fire that up and let's get into this first drive. Because, look, this was actually a game, Nick, where the Giants went three and out for the for, on their first three drives for the first time since 2017. Do you know who started that game in 2017? In 2017, yeah. you're never gonna. Was it Geno, was it Geno Smith? It was Geno Smith. So and very ironic. Open. The first time that they went <laughs> three and out for three straight drives was, or since that Geno Smith game, and now they come back. It all comes full circle as they face Geno Smith. But we'll start out with this first drive. The first play is just a good start for the Giants. A nice little quick hitting RPO for six yards to Slayton. 
And you could just see how Daniel Jones quickly makes the decision to throw this RPO. We'll look at it from the sideline angle as well. He sees the blocking. He sees kind of peers at Brooks right there. He sees Bruce Irving just staying put. Bruce Irving was just fantastic in this game, by the way. Just deliver a strike right to Slayton, who was facing off coverage to begin right here. You can see the sideline angle. He's got plenty of space just to run a couple yards downfield. Quick hitter, bang, bang. And I believe this was for six yards to set up a second and four. Yep. And then we have a second and four situation where once again, the Giants are trying to run a little bit of a corner cross or combination. They're going play action here because that's kind of what the Seahawks are giving them. And there's nothing open here. Plus there's kind of immediate pressure in Jones's face here. It looks like, I think it was Glowinski who blew this block. If I have it right in my notes. Um, yeah. And this Jones ends up kind of flowing to his right, but I don't think that's the design of the play right. at all. It just doesn't really make sense because the routes all break to the left other than the guys who were just kind of staying in pass protection who were eligible receivers in Tanner Hudson and Chris Myrick who sit down, but Darius Slayton is running from the right to the left on a deep crosser. And then Marcus Johnson is running a deep, deep corner route from the left side of the field. It's just Mark Lewinsky loses in pass protection and Daniel Jones goes to his right, which basically negates three routes and just leaves Tanner Hudson and Chris Myrick by themselves over there just kind of chipping and releasing who I don't even think they expected the football on this play and I think you made an excellent point earlier Nick when you said that part of what made this defensive effort so special by Seattle was not just that they were so disciplined in their run fits and they weren't you know they were taking away the things that Giants had done so well in the run game but it was also that like this was a good example on this play they just had su did such a good job of not biting on these play action fakes in the run game they're their second level defenders you would think in a game like this, right, where you're selling out so hard to stop the run, the Giants are running the ball so often that you would find some plays where the linebackers were totally, you know, sold, the totally sold out and bought the run. But, you know, there were very few of those, too. They felt like these second level defenders did a really good job of flowing back into passing lanes off of play action and taking away immediate, immediate, uh, you know, solutions for the Giants pass game. They were really quick, man, and they were really disciplined just because they knew the Giants passing attack basically revolved around Daniel Jones getting on the run, using his legs yeah. when that option is there. Seattle just stays put so much, man. They said, run the football on us if, if you want these backside pursuit defenders. And the crappy part for the New York Giants is up to the play side, Seattle was in position quite often. Now here yeah. we have the third and four play. Yeah, we have a third and four play here where the Giants uh, miss this and obviously go three and out here. I thought that Jones could have potentially waited a second more. I don't know why he kind of bounced to his right here within the pocket. Just kind of sit in that pocket a little bit more and then wait for the the uh, crossover the middle of the Hudson because I thought once he once he recognizes 26 carrying inside with the crawl with the first crosser that eventually goes to I think it's Marcus Johnson. Maybe you take a you maybe you kind of keep your eyes moving in that direction and then rip it back to Hudson. You can kind of see it a little better from the end zone angle. This is pretty nitpicky, so I don't want you guys to view this as like a major flaw or anything by by Jones. But I think once he sees 26 carrying 84 here, he can wait. He can kind of use his eyes, wait a second. And this we're requiring him not to bounce to his right, like where the pressure is coming back into his face. Um, just kind of sit in the middle of that pocket and then hit 88 kind of right in the middle past the sticks. Yeah, it's definitely nitpicky when the bullets are flying like this. And Neil, this guy was everywhere on the field, 26. He ended up getting hurt later in the game. I, I think he's okay, but I'm not really 100% sure. But 26 was doing so much for the Seattle defense. And right here, it's like he's watching Jones kind of already go into this passing motion to Marcus Johnson. I'm wondering if Jones yeah. came off of it, if 26 would have That's fair. sank. Or if, 26, or if 26 even knew that Tanner Hudson was there. I'm not really sure. You have two routes coming right by him in front of him Underneath, with Wondell right. Robinson. Yeah. So he might not even have known Tanner Hudson was there, but regardless, the Giants... If he doesn't know he's there, then it's an option for Jones for sure. But he, he can't really bounce to his right. He has to kind of stay in the middle of that pocket, which I don't know why he escaped it, but he decided to you know slide a little bit to his right there, which I thought made it a tougher passing window anyway for Jones. Yeah, which is unfortunate, man. I mean, this is, this is the type of game that you expect up in Seattle though, right? Like when the Giants beat... Pete Carroll and the Seattle Seahawks 20s, but there was no one in the stands. Like mm -hmm. that, that makes such a big difference. Yeah, I they, think they said that to us. That was a great point. It, it makes a lot of sense, right? Like if there was no one in the stands, who knows what happens with that game? There's just so many miscommunication errors, more specifically on the offense than the defense, which makes sense, obviously. But it was, I guess, we're gonna be positive about something. The defense played pretty they were okay. You know, they were okay for a lot of damn good in this game, considering how often yeah. they're on the field. We'll get to that tomorrow, obviously, but yeah, I, I know issues with the defense. They gave us some big plays in the passing game, but that's to be expected when you're on the field all game. Um, so here's drive two, another three and out for the giants here. 
we start off things good again. <laughs> just another RPO where they can hit the quick slant, read, read, reading number 56, and then just kind of firing. Um, good ball placement for what they, where this should be, in my opinion, just because you don't want to lead it too far inside for maybe that uh, second linebacker who's in the middle. I think it's 55 to make a play on it. So good start here to the drive with a six-yard uh, RPO. And watch Brooks right there, 56. This is who Daniel Jones is watching. His eyes go right to 56. Just deliver. 56 follows with the mesh. And then Jones looks to Wandell Robinson, puts it on the back shoulder. Six, Quandre Diggs, who was always in position as well. Doesn't pitch up, and that sets up a second and four. Everyone talks about how bad Brooks has been as like a draft pick for Seattle, Nick, but I actually felt like he had a pretty good game in this one. So I, I was maybe maybe he's coming into his own more. I agree too. I, I I agree with that. I think that's a really good statement. And I don't really pay too much attention to like Seattle Seahawks Twitter. I just remember yeah. it was bashed when bashed. when the pick was made. Yeah. yeah. And here was now, their first example on second four of look, Seattle's here to play, and they're not going to let you beat. They're not going to let the Giants beat them like everyone else is. Look at how well they play the BA bootleg here. Just totally ready for it. Fifty one. I think that's Bruce Irvin. Just take. Just not at all fooled. Yeah, Bruce Irvin gets chipped by Marcus Johnson, and you can see he doesn't crash down the line of scrimmage here at all. This is just one of those patent looks like wide zone to Saquon Barkley, and I like how the Giants also incorporated Chris Myrick as the fullback in eye formation, and then give a similar look to the eight straight plays that they ran last week in their win over Jacksonville on that final drive, only they don't pull the backside guard here, so they just basically go to like the handoff. It's a similar look, right? Maybe the defense will bite, but Bruce Irvin, he doesn't even pinch down the line of scrimmage, man. He just runs directly to where yeah. Daniel Jones is going to be. And Daniel Jones has met Bruce Irvin's right in his face. Daniel Jones is able to evade him, but great job just, by Jones to evade him, by the way. Ex great job by Jones. But this is a design shot play to Marcus Johnson. Like right. I like how the Giants are trying to create these explosive plays through the air. It's just not there because this was a really disciplined team who wasn't going to allow the Giants to get going from a play action standpoint. There's really no one else out running a route here other than Marcus right. Johnson. So this was going to be Daniel Jones, pick up a bunch of yards with your legs or fire the football to Marcus Johnson, similar to what we saw against Chicago. And then once last week against Jacksonville. Yep, exactly. Just didn't work out in their favor in this one. They ended up losing five yards on the play to set up this third and nine. Here's a call. Look, they go empty here and run the screen to Saquon Barkley, which I don't mind in general as a play call here. But in this specific play, Nick, I found it a little odd because the Seattle Seahawks have what? A four man pass rush with one guy, who, uh, one linebacker, at the end man in line scrimmage, the kid 26. You were talking about a bunch. Um, I think it's 26 there. Neil, who's just kind of spying Barkley from the start. And with just a three man pass or a four man pass rush. Somebody right keying into Barkley. It's just hard for me to imagine this working on a third and long if you're not getting any sort of blitz or any sort of blitz look. Yeah, I don't know. I think because Barkley's the wing back here. Okay. If this if Barkley catches this cleanly and Azudu is able to get to Neil here, Barkley might get a first down. He's just gonna have to make, I think, that safety miss, right? Looks like the defensive lineman's coming in, so he doesn't want to possibly, but yeah, it depends how clean he catches it. You're right. If he catches it clean, maybe he can kind of make that play. And something happened in the Giants favor on this play because, yeah, they're bringing four, but they twist up front. So the right. end goes into the B gap and <laughs> Andrew Thomas just let's watch this from the end zone angle. Andrew Thomas just takes this dude and just ragdolls him to the ground. And that's one less defender to worry yeah. about. So Zudu kicks this guy out. And then, yeah, he, yeah this, this this defender right here who's on John Feliciano if he uh, if he might be able to make this play. But if John Feliciano is just a little bit cleaner with his execution there, then you have 13 Josh Jones against Saquon Barkley in space. I think I'd sign up for that, especially yeah. when you're not doing anything else. I take know? that back. I, I take it back because I, I think you're right. It's tougher. It's it's tougher for them to kind of do operate just out of pure drop back and try to hit this on third and 10. This is, at least gives them an option to get to their best player and have him do something in space. So yeah, I'm fine with it. Just at least attempt it. Yeah. And let's one more time with Andrew Thomas, 78 on 52. Just get down. Kid. Yeah. That's a nice highlight from the game from Thomas. It's there's not a lot of highlights from the offense. You know, we got to take what we can get. Yeah. All right. We'll move on to the third drive. It's another three and out by the giants. So it's again, their third three and out to start the game. And like you said, the defense did a good job holding them in this game, despite this type of, you know, despite this happening, um, it's never great to go three and out. And we start here with a little three yard gain here um, that uh, was played really well by the Seattle Seahawks. And again, I, I think this was an RPO. We could see it more from the sideline angle, but I kind of wish, yeah, it was Daniel Jones is looking at, a player here 
and you see it here. I kind of wish he throws the bubble here. I'm wondering if he's just going to hand the football off anyways, but you can see Ooh, the bubble yeah. like right here. The read defender is this, is this player, this apex defender who cheats inside on the run to Saquon Barkley. And we always talk about numbers, right? Wondell Robinson is going to be outside the numbers with yep. one Seattle defender and one blocker. I just feel like you should throw the football in this situation because both of these Seattle Seahawks defenders that are on the screen are like five, six yards or whatever it is inside of the numbers. So you just take advantage of what the defense has given you, but Jones hands it off. And this isn't me just bashing Jones. You know, these things are really quick. These are bang, bang. I'm not even sure if, if they're just saying, you know, throw the, or we're just running that bubble. We're never going to throw it. Yeah, just let me, let me cut you off real quick here for a second. I hate how me and you both do this. We don't have to keep saying like, we're not bashing Jones or, or the words bashing and nitpicking. We we're not doing any of that. And we've never done any of that. And it's just like, I think when we use that rhetoric, it kind of gives it uh, a reality. That's not actual, not, not an actual reality. Oh, yeah, I feel you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I agree. But let's see the blocking up front too. I do feel like this with Saquon. He didn't get a lot done on the ground, but damn, this guy like yeah, has, he tried. has some ability to find the hole this season. <laughs> I know. Oh, man. He gets this really small. It has been awesome. Yeah, this only goes for three yards to set up so, this yeah. next play. To This is a big play in the game right here coming up. The second seven. It's, a really, it's the Giants' first big missed opportunity on offense. So we'll, we'll walk through this play. I think there's a lot to talk about. This is obviously, if you guys remember it, the, the really nice design by Mike Kafka to get a wheel going with Cager wide open along the right sideline. You can see Cager right off. There's so much separation there, but Daniel Jones yep. just overthrows it. And this is a, that first play, right? Because I'm not sure if 30 is supposed to abandon. I'm not sure what 30 is doing here because it looks like this is just some sort of cover three, maybe match type defense, but Darius so Slayton runs all Slayton, right? Because Slayton goes underneath all yeah. those linebackers and it just doesn't get passed off. I guess it's just because Slayton speed, they want a corner on him instead of the linebackers. I'm not this really sure. Coverage breakdown, honestly. Of the rules, but Cager just comes wide open. I'm sure in their scouting reports, they know that Lawrence Cager is a former wide receiver. Right. But he gets isolated against 52. That's what Boye Mafe, that's an edge rusher. Boye Mafe is a good athlete, but he's going to get burnt in this type of situation on the line of scrimmage. You can see Cager's wide open, fading towards the sideline. Jones just doesn't put a lot of touch on it, it seems like. It just kind of leads him a little bit too much because it's not like Cager's slowing down or anything. Cager's hustling. Yeah, but the, you, you nailed it. And, you know, you can talk about the pressure immediately from Azudu. Nobody wants that, obviously. But if you look at it from the other angle, the throw is made completely before he gets hit. So even with that kind of pressure, you know, great quarterbacks will make this throw nine of nine of 10 times, to be completely honest, even with this kind of pressure. I mean, you guys have seen it yourselves with, with all the elites. Um, let's watch it from this angle throw off before the before the hit. Um, obviously, you don't want to see him taking that hit, and you don't want to see Azudu have, having a rep like that in pass pro. And there's no there's no doubt about it in my mind, Nick, that Daniel Jones had a much better chance to complete this throw if Azudu didn't give up this immediate pressure. But at the same time, I still think, and, I, and I'm sure you agree, that the throw needs to be made. Yeah, so definitely needs to be made. And LJ Collier, man, that was one of the guys that, there's the hand thing you were talking yeah. about, by the way. There's the LJ. Azudu hand thing. Watch it. What is he doing? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. He's swatting flies, man. Now I'm not. I'm not honestly. All game. He was. Maybe he had it's other a weird hand things too going on all game. LJ Collier was a part of my group when I was down at the uh, Reese Senior Bowl. I was an intern there who was like a yeah. charge of the defensive line, and LJ Collier was one of those guys. And if you were to ask me, hey Nick, who was going to be the first pick from that group of players that I had? It would not have been LJ Collier, <laughs> but, but it was LJ Collier who ended up being a back end number one right. first round pick, which was kind of crazy. And one more thing. If, yeah, go ahead. I'm wondering if Azudu expected help here, though. But That's Irvin, what I'm too. But he squares up to Collier right here, and Irving is there. So there has to be some sort of presence on Irvin. So he wasn't in the account. So I just think this is just Josh Azudu just getting his outside hand swatted and then just surrendering his outside shoulder. And damn, yep. Jones gets clotheslined on that play. Jones too. gets killed on this because of Azudu. One more thing, go back to this end zone angle. One thing that we've seen throughout Jones's career, and at this point, I just don't think the coaches are trying to change this about his game because it's we've seen this with multiple staffs. He continues to burp the baby here. This is a timing play where if Jones has maybe one more second here to to make this to to, to get the throw off a, a second earlier, he might be able to complete it. But he once again burps the baby here, as you can see at the end, um, just by putting that second hand on the ball before throwing it. And that kind of slows the timing down, takes it a tick off. Yeah, but I mean, he led him on this play. So like, I don't, yeah. I think he has to buy time in this type of situation rather than get it off quicker 
to allow Cager to kind of get towards the sideline. Either way, I mean, he ends up missing it. Yeah, I just he does, he does that little pat. Just think the pat. The, and Brett, for those, I think we've gone over before, but burping the baby is just patting the football with with your off hand. Um, I just think it slows down. It just messes with the timing a bit of any any passer. He doesn't do it all the time, too. It's weird. He does it sometimes. I think he does it when he needs to buy time. Gotcha. Like when 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 he needs that route to develop a little bit more. Because he knew where he was going with it. It's right. not like when you're burping the baby and you're just kind of going through your progressions and you have no idea what you're doing with the football. Like He had his defined read. He was just allowing it to get more separation because he had the matchup that he wanted with Cager against uh, Boye Mafe. I believe that was Mafe. Yeah, the, end, the edge there. So that was a, another incompletion for the Giants there. And then we get to this third down. Actually, it might have been Taylor. But anyways, go on. Yeah. 52, I think it's Taylor. Um, so now we have a third and long situation to cover one look from the Seattle Seahawks here. And they really have, they really try to bracket wall off Wandell Robinson and, and Jones is kind of locked into this Wandell Robinson route. There's probably not too much else for him. He ends up coming back to Marcus Johnson. If he doesn't stay so long on Wandell Robinson, I think there might be a chance for him to get onto uh, Marcus Johnson earlier in it out of his break. What are your thoughts on that? And either way, I think once you see Wondell Robinson kind of walled off here, you got, you got to come off that quick regardless. Yeah, I like how uh, Seattle was defending the middle of the field. They know that the Giants attempt to own the middle of the field and really attack it. And Wondell Robinson here, he's the number two, well, actually technically the number three receiver at the top of the screen. He just runs a quick spot just beyond the sticks. The middle linebacker just turns, takes underneath, and then his cornerback just goes over the top. He's completely bracketed and eliminated, eliminated from this play. So Ideally, you want Jones to go to a secondary option. And I think if he did go to a secondary option here, he would have found Marcus Johnson out of his breaks. If you look on the sideline angle, you can see Marcus Johnson once he comes out of that break. And that's that's who Daniel Jones ends up targeting and it gets knocked away. But right here, if the ball is already out right now, right. Marcus Johnson, this is a catch. He runs to the catch point. He's about six yards past the sticks. This is an easy first down completion. But Jones takes him a second to work back to that because he was on Wandale a little bit too long and then the ball ends up going incomplete. So it's not that's like Johnson didn't have separation there. Johnson was open. Yeah, that's a great breakdown by you. It's just that separation doesn't last forever in the NFL. I want to watch Jones's eyes. Yeah, he's really on there for a while. I mean, you could just see from that angle how long he's he's looking at the Wanda, at the at Wandale. I guess he's waiting for Wandale to get open. I just don't understand with 50 like the way that 56 plays this. I think you got to know to get off that right like even sooner than there seems like he's influencing somebody too or just checking on somebody's position yeah maybe that's safety over the top yeah wandell stops there and then ultimately throws a little late um and gives 30 time to break on it and he makes a good incompletion uh, a good pbu there incomplete pass but guys luckily (laughs) on the fourth drive it's not a three and out the giants are able to (laughs) assemble some offense here as they get into the second quarter of the game yeah, so they finally get something going as far as just like a first down goes. And it starts with one of their go-to plays, the little pin-pull concept. They're in 13 personnel. Cager, actually, this is the play I was talking about, one of the plays I was talking about earlier. Cager does a nice job sealing at the end of this. Um, and so this has been a play that's been working for the Giants, getting Brett Barkley in space, you know, allowing those those players to uh, kind of like pin and pull, classic power gap. What are your thoughts on this play? Yeah, this is a play we saw a lot in week one. I think it's well executed. I love how Chris Myrick just takes out Bruce Irvin, allows Andrew Thomas yep. to climb, locate the linebacker. And all you want to do in, on this play is isolate Saquon Barkley against Quandre Diggs. That's what you want. And that's exactly what happens. Saquon Barkley against a safety. Safety makes a nice play to make this tackle on Barkley. So that's a well-blocked, well-schemed play. And I also love, like you brought up, Lawrence Cager and what he does at Tariq Woolen here. And you're going to see the Giants attempt to do this later. And I love the adjustment that Seattle makes. And you're going to see Tariq Woolen in this similar type of situation (laughs) on the line of scrimmage. Say if it were this play, we'll go over it when it happens. And I think it's David Sills that he does this to, but it It might be Hudson. No, it is Sills. Once Sills releases off the line of scrimmage, like where Tanner Hudson is on the screen, Woolen just knocks him on his ass and then peels off and gets back into his run fit in, in his position. Like those little type of adjustments can go a long way in this game to just not allow sills to make that pin block on that play we'll see that a little later though and yeah nick when you bring up adjustments like that in game seattle made and just kind of how disciplined they were and how they did everything to stop this giants offense doing the things that they wanted to do and they had success doing i gotta give a shout out to clinton hurt he's not really a known defensive coordinator in the nfl came up through the ranks with seattle was promoted i think this season and 
this is with a really well coached defense. It might have been the most well coached defense I saw all year so far. I mean, Dallas, you can point to them, but part of Dallas's appeal is they have just insane level of talent on their defense. This isn't really the most, this at least didn't jump out to me on paper as the most talented defense the Giants played by any means, but they played it really smart. And this guy deserves, I think that that, that hurt deserves a shout out. Definitely, definitely. Good to give him the shout out. And now we're going to have a second and one after a nine yard gain on that pin pull concept from 13 personnel. Now we have pistol formation. And this was something that I felt like was something the Giants used a lot in the second quarter. Sometimes in the third quarter was this pistol counter type of run where you bring Tanner Hudson to the play side, pull the backside guard, and then Saquon Barkley opening to the backside pivots off the counter and then follows his blockers. And you're going to see all throughout the game how well Seattle ends up defending this. And here you can see there is a glimmer of hope from the rushing attack because the Giants, Chris Myrick, picks up that Mike linebacker right there. And there's a little bit of a hole off of the kickout block from Tanner Hudson and the lead block from Josh Azudu. But you have those backside defenders kind of just get to Saquon Barkley. And this only ends up going for four yards. But this was one of the plays where it was like it was blocked up solidly, but still yeah. not too much of a rushing lane because the backside blockers didn't do as well as, as they had been throughout this season. Yep. And then we had uh, this first and 10 play where, you know, this was a great example, I think, on film, at least of how Seattle was just so dialed in in their run defense. Yeah, and you could see this was a what, scrape and replace. We talk about this a lot, right? Because it's a zone read game. What did the, what are the Seattle Seahawks going to do with the end man on the line of scrimmage? They're going to run him directly at Daniel Jones. And this is what they did so much in this game. They would just take him and just run him directly at the mesh point. And then what do they do? They replace that defender with right, another right. contained defender. So Daniel Jones is reading that, that defender who's pinching, but he also sees the other defender stepping down. So he has to hand this football off. And now you have this other defender kind of breaking right through the C gap right here. It's an aggressive way to play the zone read. And I believe this was the type of play that we mentioned on the mailbag when we went over it, Dan. Exactly the type of play How do you, you mention. Yeah. And this was what the Giants ended up doing against Lamar Jackson, which a hot ward who packs a little bit more of a punch than this defender, but it goes for nothing. And it's kind of a weird setup to me from the Giants pre, like pre-snap, Nick, because you don't have any receivers on that side of the field. So there's no real reason for that end man who replaces to not replace, right? Like there's nothing holding him back from not replacing. So maybe to me, it's I think like, why don't you put 83? It looks like is that Kadri? Yeah, 83 in motion to the other side and just run this pl- flip where you run this play. Like I don't. Uh, I almost think like you flip Barkley, you flip Cager before the snap and you and you run it the opposite way. At least that way, you know, you have the receivers on the on, on the other side of the field who the defensive backs have to account for. I just don't see any reason why they wouldn't play this the way they played this Seattle by, like you said, scraping with the first with the first end of yep. line of scrimmage and it's replacing. And then there's just no solution. So it's kind of just like a dead play in the water. It, it seems like. Yeah, that's what it at least looks like right here. And ideally both of those defenders wouldn't have reacted the way they did. I think that's what the Giants hoped, right? Okay. Like you have the end man on the line of scrimmage kind of maybe get picked up by the tight end, the nub that is on right. that. And then the other guy plays contain. And now both of those defenders are eliminated from the play and you hand the football off to Saquon Barkley with blockers and one less man to worry about. So I think that's what the Giants were hoping for. It's just on the line of scrimmage. I think that's Tanner Hudson just did not do a good job uh, holding or Chris Myrick did not do a good job holding that end man on the line of scrimmage in place. Yep. Okay. That's fair. So now we're in a second 10 after that failed first play, just a little wildcat here, little pin pull concept. Uh, Giants do a good job, pick up five yards on this play. I thought at first, maybe Barkley could have taken the first hole and gotten vertical, but I think he actually picked his way and found an even better hole uh, at the end of this play. So I, I kind of like this execution all around. Yeah, I think, I think he made the right choice here. There's, yeah, pursuing defenders from the backside coming in. It's also right. just awkward watching Saquon Barkley run with his, what is that, his, his mouthpiece stuck yeah. in his, the top of his <laughs> face mask. So it looks like he has a little antenna or something on the top of his head. Good block by Gary Great Brightwell. Block by Brightwell, wow. Look at that. Gary Brightwell really does a How good job. How we use our backs as lead blockers on some of these plays. But the thing is, they're good at it, man. No, like, Gary Brightwell's that, damn good at it. Matt Breed is not a big guy by any means, but like he throws his body around. Yeah. And, and he could be effective. That sets up this third and five right here. Easy, nice solution by the Giants here against a nice, uh, you know, a little, what is this, cover three or cover one? I believe it's cover one, but this is just a cover three type of beater right here. Mainly just what I mean by that is you're 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 attacking the off leverage. This could be three match, right. actually. And whenever Wondell Robinson was, 
Quandre Diggs was just tasked to carry, or was that Bryant number eight's task to carry Wandell Robinson if he goes vertical over the middle of the field. But you could see how Darius Slayton just runs that quick hitch against off leverage. Tanner Hudson, you kind of angle inward and then just run the corner route, possibly just be eye candy to open up this quick little hitter. And I like how Jones was decisive to see an open Darius Slayton and he executed to move the sticks, which is something that the Giants failed to do a lot this game. And from the end zone angle, pretty good pass protection across the board with the exception of, I guess, Phillips, who didn't do terrible, tried to kind of wash him up the arc. But this is kind of Phillips, I thought, was probably their weak link in my mind in pass pro this game. What are your thoughts on that, Nick? Um, yeah, I would agree. Yeah. yeah. Feliciano obviously has his moments every game where he kind of just loses ground. But Phillips, a lot of the plays were kind of like this, where he tried to wash him up the arc and 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 still felt like the edge guy got a little bit of bend at the end and, and had some pressure. This one, it didn't matter, though. It was a quick game type of thing. But still good to see that kind of pass protection across the board, minus 79. Yeah, Mafe is 51, by the way. And I should have known that. But Andrew Thomas right here, man, just... Mafe realizes that Matt Breida is staying in protection. He tries to spin inside, but Andrew Thomas is just so quick and so light on his feet. That's the best way to describe Thomas and why he's so dominant. He's quick and he's light on his feet. I love the light on, on his feet take by you there because I really think that's the difference there with, with what has made Thomas so elite. But anyway, the Giants pick up this first down. Finally, yeah. But then they walk it right back with a five-yard penalty on first down, which is just stupid, setting up this first and 15. Jones doesn't like what he sees and runs with it. Um. I don't really think there was anything open for Daniel Jones on this when you see it from the sideline angle, Nick. I did think eventually Feliciano lost his ground, which seems to be the case uh, a decent amount with Feliciano as far as the offensive line goes. But he did block for long enough that I can't really uh, knock him for it. This reminded me of that route they ran earlier in the year, which I'm not sure if they threw. It was maybe like a few games ago, Nick. It was one of the home games. Uh, just at the this is at the bottom of your screen if you're watching along, where it's just kind of like the one guy broke open at the end. I forgot if it was James on that route early in the season. Do you know the route I'm talking about? I do believe I know the route you're talking about. Yeah, both, both the wide receivers are kind of running in the same exact stem of each other. They're both yes. angled inward, and there's about a one-yard difference between Darius Slayton and Marcus Johnson. And the creative thing about this is, yes, you're opening to the inside, so you're influencing the entire defense to the inside, but then they both break outside, but it's the outermost receiver who is Darius Slayton who breaks underneath Marcus Johnson. So the timing really needs to be on point during this play. And it kind of is here. It gets maybe a little sloppy at like this moment where Darius Slate, not Darius Slayton does a really good job actually turning that. And Slayton ends up kind of coming open, but I feel like this underneath defender, I wish you guys could yeah. see my cursor, ends up kind of covering it up. So I don't hate the fact that Daniel Jones just tucked it here, but this is a long developing play off of play action where there are four eligible receivers out, actually five eligible receivers out to run the route with four guys four guys rushing the passer, only five in protection, which isn't necessarily the best situation for the Giants, but I feel like they block it up well. It's just Jones didn't really like what he saw, and honestly, there wasn't really that much there because Seattle really did a good job realizing that this play design was to their right side, so all of those zones just kind of flowed a little bit more to the right to constrict the throwing windows. Yeah, I thought this was played insanely well by Seattle, to be honest, the second level. I'm happy Jones and pulled the trigger on that on that throw, which is really too tough of a throw to make, especially that side of the field. Um, so, yeah, just really what well, good play by the defense. Nothing you can say other than that. Uh, Giants try a little power and gap with a puller on the second and nine. But as we'll see throughout the game, Nick, there's Seattle linebackers are just dialed in to what the Giants uh, want to do. Geez. Yeah, this is nothing. This was one of the best plays by Brooks right here, number 56. And you can watch, watch, just watch their eyes, the second level defenders. They see Josh Azudu. They know the Giants love to pull the backside guard. So they see the backside guard, Josh Azudu pull, and Brooks just gets right in position. He's square to Saquon Barkley in the hole behind the line of scrimmage. Like that is an insanely, insanely that's good like play. Teach tape. That's like teach tape at the linebacker position, right? Like that's like, like you see coaches use that. Yeah. Somewhere Carl Banks is like, man, that young guy, he can really play. Like, like, that is just an excellent play by this this kid. Instincts, right vision, like instincts, processing, like you said, with the Zudu, understanding what what the puller means to the play. Just that's the type of linebacker play. I hope eventually the Giants will have somebody who can give them that. Yes, and I also like the power that Azudu brings into the onto number fifty three. Oh right yeah, there. great point. Back. See that. That's the type of raw stuff you see from Azudu. Like there's all these Azudu is such an interesting prospect right now for the Giants. He has flashes of just dominant plays like that. And then he has just the pass pro where he's just totally like off guard and beat early. 
Uh, so it's just like right now, he's a really raw prospect that they're they're forced to play at this point. Now, will that change with Gates coming up? I don't know. It's very possible to me. But personally, I'd like to see Gates at center. I'm not a big Feliciano fan by any means. He's okay. He has some moments in the run game, but the pass pro is just, I didn't see what, what, what I see from Feliciano in the past game, Nick, is just something I never had to worry about too much with Nick Gates when he was like fully in that center role before the injury. So we'll see what happens there, but it's going to be interesting what they do with that interior line coming out of the bye week. Yeah, I'm excited to see. I'm also just excited to see how much healthier the Giants can get. You're obviously going to be one more week True. closer to getting a lot of these these pieces back. But like Kenny Galladay could realistically be healthy for the next game, which say what you want about Kenny Galladay. I still think he can offer something, maybe a little bit more than what some of these other pieces who are running routes for the New York Giants right now. He can offer more are. than David Sills for sure in my mind. He might be able to offer more than Marcus Johnson. That is up not from debate. a speed, not from not a at speed. all from a speed <laughs> from a separation standpoint. No, but you know, just from a savvy standpoint, there's still things that he does that I think are you know good as a wide receiver. Here's the third and nine that the Giants um, do not convert. Here, this is so uh, again they had three three and outs and they finally got a first down in this drive, but it was short lived. Um, just one first down and a punt, I believe it was, or two first downs. Sorry, and a punt. Um, so this one, I thought. From my vantage point, Nick, again, I don't want to sound nitpicky here, but I just think that eventually this Wandel, there's really nowhere to go with the ball. So I want to start by saying that, like the only potential window at all. Actually, I don't see any window, but yeah, so never mind. No need to nitpick. This is a, it was a good pocket, though. Like I didn't think Daniel Jones needed to kind of move in the pocket as he did, I guess would be my only nitpick. Yeah, no, I'm, fi- I'm, I'm fine with what Daniel Jones did here. He ends up checking down to Tanner Hudson and... Tanner Hudson doesn't get the first down. I don't even think it's ruled a catch. I think it's the ball nowhere near the first. Down. Yeah, it's nowhere near the first down. But I also I don't want to be nitpicky with the uh, play calling or anything like okay. that. But these are long developing routes right here. It's a third yep. and nine though, so I get that. But you have basically two horizontal crosses from the field side, and Marcus Johnson with a switch release. Marcus Johnson's a number two wide receiver. He's going to angle outward and then run the dig with the horizontal cross from the number one receiver who is outside the numbers in Wandale Robinson. I don't hate that route concept on these third and long types of situations, but there's really nowhere for Daniel Jones to go off the check down other than Tanner Hudson. And I get it. The, uh, you need Darius Slayton to kind of be the clear out to open up these possible backside dig and horizontal crossing routes, but there's just nothing there because Seattle is in a cover two type of defense and it takes forever for these guys to get in and out of their routes. And they dropped a good depth too. Yeah. They dropped the excellent depth. They dropped the sticks. Essentially. They weren't going to allow the giants to be able to watch, Boy, I'm off. Get, get used to the NFL there, kid. Just yeah. get tossed to the ground by Andrew Thomas, man. This is a great rep from Thomas. If you're looking on the left side, I, I'll back it up a little bit because I do want to give credit. I used the word nitpick earlier when I said I didn't want to use that anymore, so I apologize for that. But I do want to give credit here to the Giants pass protection because if you look at this pocket, even once Jones decides, pause it right when Jones decides to do all that stuff that I don't really know why he decides to do. This pocket is as pretty as it gets in the NFL. I mean, you got Saquon Barkley helping to the only hint of pressure. I don't exactly know why Jones kind of slides to his left here, shuffles, and then kind of like... Because he sees the B-gap open. That's why. Oh, because he's like, thinking about running it? Yeah. Um, we'll switch to this screen to do this. I really do think that Daniel Jones is told, like, if that B-gap is open, if there's any rushing room, Just take, take what's there. Okay. Yeah. And I've seen people, and we're going to go over the red zone play where Jones misses Tanner Hudson, and I've seen people kind of say, well, yeah, well, that's what they're being taught to do, right? Like, if you see someone, or if you see an opening, take it with your legs. But I can guarantee you what they're not being taught to do, Dan, or what he's not being taught to do, is if there's someone wide open downfield <laughs> in the end Don't zone, run, take, yeah. take the B-gap that's yeah. open. Like, that's not happening. Like, that's going to yeah. piss Brian Dable off, right? So, yeah. but I do believe, man, hey, if it's a little bit unclear, use your athletic ability and get down. I think that's definitely a talking point and a message from this coaching staff. That's a good evaluation because there's no real, in my mind, explanation for him to be so anti in the pocket there. Because uh, like if you look at just the the still shot of it, a few a few ticks back, there's just there's no pressure anywhere coming from it. Really, once once Barkley helps to pick up, um, and he had already taken the step forward there, he really could have just kind of sat in the middle of that depth. Yeah, just right there, just kind of. That's the only thing that I have with Jones that's still in the pocket. Sometimes I just don't understand why he. Some of these, like I just think sometimes you just got to stay where in your at your spot when when you don't really need to move off of it. But it's all right. I get it. He's trying to move. He's trying to run. He's trying to take the B gap, like you said. And I think ultimately when he goes to run here, he kind of realizes, oh, crap, I can't really do anything. <laughs> so no. he just yeah, I think ball. he sees uh, who is that? Uh, 
think he sees his defender kind of come in on him and yep. he realizes I might not be able to outrun him. Yeah, yeah, 51. Guy, 51. Guy yeah, we keep calling. I keep messing up these guys' numbers. Isn't 51 actually Bruce Irvin? <laughs> 51 <laughs> is Irvin, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I think I called him off before, like a dumbass. Yeah, Sorry, everybody. Right. Not a dumbass. We don't we don't follow. We don't we don't comment on the Seahawks. We're not gonna learn all these guys by exact numbers in one game. So I don't think that's bad at all. Just my take. But um anyway, the Giants missed this. They they're forced to punt again. Look, at least they got two first downs on this drive. Four drives, two first downs, not ideal. And then they catch a break here. Um, with the Tyler Lockett fumble, it's 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 half break, half amazing play by Dory Jackson to go for that football, like an old, you know, an all peanut Tillman type of forced fumble there. Um, so it sets up this first and goal situation on their fifth drive, um, where it's two runs and a touchdown. Uh, well, we'll obviously want to show the second one just because it does feature our boy Nick Gates getting his first snap of the season and making an impact. Yes, but the first one, you get to see more upside from Josh Azudu here. So Josh Azudu helps the center out with the nose, and there's obviously a bunch of guys up in the line of scrimmage. The ball is really close to the goal line. And you can see Chip drive to the ground, locate that second-level defender. That's a really nice play right there from Josh Azudu. Chip Excellent drive. Play. Yeah, and he's so quick to transition, too. This is the type of stuff that Dan and I talk about with Josh Azudu. It's like, yeah, you got to kind of take the good with the bad. But some of the good is like, dude, if we could fix a bad, we got ourselves a really good starter here. And I think that's a really good indication of what we're talking about. That's a great way to put it, too, because it's the the, the good with him is insanely quick feet and com combination of feet, of quick feet and power. And that's like, right, like you look at Josh Azudu versus our other guard, Mark Lewinsky. It's impossible to think that Lewinsky has anywhere near the upside of a Josh Azudu. Like, I'm happy they signed him. They wanted some stability on line. Can you imagine how bad things would be right now if we just had to, like, go to some rando at right guard like last year? Because I don't even know who they'd be playing right now at right guard. Um, it's tough, man. And so you just got to love to see those flashes of more upside because ultimately you do want kind of an upside player on your offensive line as well. Somebody who can give you these types of flash plays. Look at this mascot. This is no Mr. Met over here. You know what I'm saying? I don't even know what he's looking at the mascot. That was weird. I mean, he's looking through the mouth. Those aren't his real eyes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. A little inside info from him for the little inside mascot info from Nick. Don't ask him how he knows all that. <laughs> <laughs> now we have the touchdown run from Saquon. Just There's finding Gates. the hole. Gates on There's Irvin. Nick Gates. Gates on Irvin. He just plows him out of the out of the way here. I will say this though, what Seattle is doing. Is they're releasing and they're stunting their right. defensive linemen into the adjacent gap. So Irvin's path is to stunt inside where Nick Gates just kind of uses his momentum and drives him away. It's just Nick Gates is able to use his momentum and drive him away so effectively right here. And that's exactly where the touchdown comes from, right off the ass of Nick Gates. I mean, talk about a comeback story, bro. And we'll see it later in a couple other plays. One specific that Gates was in on was just a two yard gain. But one thing I always appreciated about watching Nick Gates on tape is he finishes every freaking play, man. I mean, he is violent with his finishes. He's aggressive. They said he's like a means. What was the word they used to use? Nasty Nick Gates. Like he really is nasty and fin and does not take reps off. He finishes every rep through the whistle. And dude, he almost gets into fights almost every single game, but he's yeah. not also being like an idiot about it. You know, it's yeah, just like dumb penalties, right? He's not taking dumb penalties. I mean, he tried to fight Aaron Donald. I think he almost got into a Jordan Brooks in this game. Like I'm just ecstatic yeah. that this dude is back, bro. Yeah. We'll see what happens there. There is a path for him to potentially start playing a starter role. I don't want to rule that out at all. We get to drive six. It's another three and out for the giants here. Um, not their best drive at all. They try a little zone read first. Yeah, well, this was the uh, this was the very uber conservative drive where Brian Dable wanted oh, right. to see what was half. Half. Yep. Yeah, right before the halftime. And they have uh, a big F up on the third down. No one knows what happened there. We can get to that in a second. Yeah, I have no idea what happened there. The I know exactly. Down what is it. once again Azudu. Is this the second down play? Nah, this is still the first down play, but we'll get to the second down play right now, and you're gonna see second and seven after three yards are picked up by Daniel Jones, who did a good job reading the defender on the zone read. Here's Azudu with his head down looking, and then here comes the arm forward. Yep, he loves to do that. I don't really know why, but he does do that. I'd be interested to ask that. <laughs> like, if we were beat guys, I'd be interested to figure out what that's all about. Azudu does, does a good, a good job. job blocking. <laughs> he does a really good job blocking on this play. Yeah, he does. And Saquon is just trying to pick his hole right here. And is there an argument like this is just a really good play by the defensive lineman because he gets blocked out of the play by Josh Azudu. This is a three technique who kind of slants right to the midline of Josh Azudu. 
And you could see how Saquon Barkley has a two-way go right here. But the best w- place that Saquon Barkley could go is to cut it to his right, but he can't because that defender's leverage right. and how that defender sets up. And you could see how Saquon Barkley's forced to cut back, and now the defender closes back to the play side where Saquon Barkley cut. And then he ends up making the tackle. That's Josh Azudu's defender. That's just a really excellent play by 93 of Seattle right there, who really kind of took away what could have been a huge play. Because if Sa- if Josh Azudu is able to get his hips to the inside shoulder of this defensive lineman, then Saquon Barkley is going to hit the initial hole that he wanted to hit with two blockers and both of those other defense defenders being locked up by Mark Lewinsky and Tyree Phillips. So it would just be Barkley against that safety. Who's kind of creeping down into the box right at this moment. Right. But he has to cut back and then everybody kind of closes in on him. And this only goes for a couple of yards. It kind of reminded me of how um, two weeks ago when they played the Ravens, how Metabuke played or however you pronounce that guy's name, played the giants in the run game. Justin Metabuke. Yeah, exactly. And so now we have this third and two. This is a really weird one because it seems like they're just miscommunicate here. There's a free rusher here because the offensive line sets up for a screen on the left side of the field, but there's no one to throw the screen to. Daniel Jones obviously doesn't look like he thinks this is a screen call. So, I mean, I could surmise here just from speculation, Nick, that they just it's loud, it's super loud here at this point in the stadium, and they just didn't communicate the right check to the or something was wrong with the communication pre-snap. Yeah, there was only two guys who didn't get it, it seemed like. And that was, well, I don't know. You have a Zudu pulling too. Why exactly is yeah, a Zudu pulling? He's pulling in another direction, looking so like it. Weird. Like, I don't know if it would have been a screen or a fake run or what exactly is happening. But then you have John Feliciano and Andrew Thomas both releasing to the offensive left side in a screen. And there's no eligible receivers anywhere <laughs> yeah. around that. Saquon Barkley's on the other side of the field. You have both the two by two sets mirrored, they're both just running routes. You have mesh concept, and then one's a clear out with another over. And then Daniel Jones just ends up getting sacked by Boye Mafe from the blind side because two of his offensive linemen released into a screen. <laughs> and that's the end of the half. Good news is the Giants did get a lot more offense going in the second half. They had multiple drives that burned a ton of clock, but they had some success. They they took a lot of, th- you know, it required a lot of third and long conversions, which is the good news about Daniel Jones' performance and just the Giants' passing game's performance in this game. But, you know, the problem was, which we talked about in the past, one of these was a 14 play. The first one we're about to do a 14 play 79 yard drive ends in three. And that's been the difference this year. The Giants have been converting these drives into touchdowns at a middle of the pack rate, still not top 10, top five, but it was just above the middle of the pack in this game. They had to settle for field goals that ended up ultimately killing them. Um, and so we'll talk about what happens when they bog down in the red zone. Uh, but let's start this drive off with the play I referenced a little bit earlier here. Um, just, you know, a, a, just a two yard play on split inside zone. But I just love Nick Gates on this play. Yeah, you can see how Nick Gates is driving his defender well off the ball. And this was one of the adjustments that the Giants made. They're like, okay, we're down tight ends. What are we going to do? We're just going to go in in these situations. We saw Jason Garrett do this. We've seen Mike Kafka do this. And we're going to use jumbo personnel, big offensive linemen. So you have Josh Azudu, Andrew Thomas, and Nick Gates all to the left of the center. And then you're just running the ball. And you have basically three blockers who are going to take on this three technique and then climb up to the mic with Chris Myrick coming from the opposite side of the formation as the H back to kick out Bruce Irvin. And then Saquon Barkley just finds the cutback, but Chris Myrick doesn't really kick out Bruce Irvin. Seattle keeps everything super tight. John Feliciano kind of loses at the point of attack. And then there's really nowhere for Saquon to go, but he's still able to find a freaking hole just to pick up like two yards on this play. But it was again, really well defended by Seattle. And I just like watching on that play Nick Gates there because he he chips first and then he climbs to the second level and watch how he finishes this block. This is just what I love about Gates. He's finished, finished, boom. He puts his guy on the ground. You even after that, you can see him have like one more kind of like fire down with his right shoulder. <laughs> he just like even when the dude's down, he's like planting him, just further planting him, making sure that if that whistle isn't blown, I am going to put this man in the ground. He really is a nasty player. That's what you want from offensive line. And I know you get he John Feliciano gets that rep. To me, I haven't seen that nearly as much as uh, with Nick Gates. And here on the second and eight, at a, by the way, pistol. I like to see the Giants using a little bit of pistol lately. And just for those who don't know, pistol is uh, with the running back lined up directly behind the quarterback, which is not traditional. You don't see it often in the NFL. But this to me is just like the most insane individual play of the game by Saquon Barkley here because this is not really well blocked. And Barkley just kind of has ridiculous cuts to create space and he breaks and he has a missed tackle like right here. He should be dead to rights. Nope. Nope. And then one more missed tackle just for good nature. Yeah. I love pistol counter right here. This is the play we kind of went over before you bring the sniffer ends up actually, well, he was like a wide receiver well off 
the ass of Andrew Thomas, but you bring him to kick out and you can see how Seattle uses the wrong arm technique. So I feel like Tanner Hudson does a good job adjusting to that and then just creating a seal right there. He just pins instead of kick kicks the defender out. He just pins him to the line of scrimmage, allowing Saquon Barkley to bounce everything outside. Josh Azudu ends up kicking out his player. And then you can see how Saquon Barkley ends up stiff arming Darius Slayton, who does a good job, yeah. you know, just yeah. kind of like <laughs> dancing backwards right here. Like, oh, sorry, Saquon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly and then he has a missed tackle after that. this is definitely yeah. a good example though of kind of what they lose when they have a tanner hudson on the field because this is not really a well-executed block by tanner hudson by any means no i actually think it i think it's you okay. like what he does here okay i do because there's multiple ways defenders can handle these these backside pullers like this right like you can go in with the squeeze technique which is you go in with your inside shoulder and then you keep your outside shoulder free trying to, you know, if you bounce it outside, I have my outside hand, my outside shoulder is free so I can make that tackle. Or you can go in and just try to create a pile up essentially. And you can see how the Seattle defender here tries to create a pile up. He goes in with right. his outside right. hand and then there's really no hole for Saquon to go into. So now he has to bounce this run outside to the secondary force can contain defenders. And you can see both of the Seattle Seahawks are right there, but look at Saquon right here. Like this is an insane screenshot of Saquon. If you're watching on YouTube right now, and if you're not, you should go and check it out. Saquon's legs are so wide and Saquon is just putting all of his weight on that outside foot. Cause he's reading the fact that both contain defenders, secondary contained defenders are in position. So he reads the block of Darius Slayton and Josh Azudu. Darius Slayton doesn't never get there, but he sees the cutback lane and he cuts it right back up field. It's so skinny yards. through that hole. Saquon's so special, man. He really is. It's so skinny through that. So, so well done. Close. Yeah. And this 15 yep. yards set up a first a and 240 10. pound back. Like he shouldn't, he runs kind of sometimes like he's like a 190, 200 pound back really, which is crazy. Um, just incredible individual play to give the giants a first down, which they definitely needed here. Uh, then of course here as you're watching here, try to run a bit, run a bit, uh, run that HP pitch. Um, some jet motion pre snap just doesn't really go anywhere. Nah, play gets bottled up. I think it goes for a two yard gain to set up a play action pass that ends up going to David Sills, which we'll go yeah, over little, right now. Little five yarder here. This is the one where you kind of wish that he dumped it down to Brita instead and used yep. Sills as kind of a lead blocker. Yeah, I think uh, Mark Sanchez brought that up on the on the telecast and it is he's right though too because they're both open in the flat but you can but he use chooses to go to sills. if you get that ball right out too it's got to be right out to, to brita um you might have sills as a lead blocker maybe yeah either way it ends up going for five yards here and then there was a offsides that kind of negated uh, daniel jones sack on third and three to set up this first and ten look who's out there nick gates jumbo set once again Dude, these Look at these cuts by Barkley. <laughs> it's silly. Like Saquon Barkley hits the hole here, and he just cuts. For those listening on the podcast, he just cuts like five times, and he only ends up picking up four yards on this play. But it's such an impressive four yards that he ends up picking up. <laughs> the hardest four yards of the game by far, and he should be dead to right. That's the other thing. Like he should have. There should be a loss. Like the Seattle played this really well. Um, looks like who is that? 70, 76. Uh, doesn't really do a great job here, Feliciano, of, of winning his block. And then Barkley just makes it moot by by beating by beating him with a cut. Um, so he does a lot. He wins a lot of these one-on-ones with just pure, awesome cutback ability. And so he turns what should have been one uh, a negative one or zero-yard gain to four. And just look at Seattle. We talk about, you know, run fits a lot in Seattle's discipline. You can see how this is. Daniel Jones is going to open to the weak side, halfback misdirection right there, and then turn to the play side right there with David Seals acting as that lead blocker. And just look, where where is there for Saquon Barkley to go other than where he went? Everything is just kind of blocked up right there. Yep. And even where he goes, there's nowhere to go. They fill that immediately um, with Luciano <laughs> loses his block, but he just finds a way. Guy still picks up four yards, man. It's incredible. Now they run pistol again. Second pistol, which is interesting. Uh, only this time <laughs> it, doesn't go, it doesn't go anywhere. Yeah, is that a little pi pistol sound? It was blown up though. Yeah. And it was blown up because Tanner Hudson right there. Hudson, and this is like yep. one of the plays where I just shook my head. Like Daniel Bellinger typically Never does a much better this. job. Now he goes after that backside hip and then just kind of hugs him and slides off of him. Very sloppy looking. And Saquon Barkley gets this football and there's a guy right in his face right away. And it ends up just being a yep. negative game. 
really, really well played by the Seahawks. Because even if Hudson doesn't blow that block, I feel like there's really nowhere to go there. Um, so just a good play by the Seattle Seahawks. And that sets up a delay of game, which again, is killing the Giants here because they lost a yard to go to third and seven. Then they had a delay of game that puts them in this third and 12 situation. But really good job here by Daniel Jones and Darius Slayton to dig him out of this situation. Jones with his best, in my mind, anticipatory throw of the game. He releases this ball well before Darius Slayton gets out of his break which to me shows great anticipation. And he drives this football with nice pace, nice velocity, great pocket as well. Another really good pocket, despite a third and long situation. Giants giving Jones a lot of good pockets so far in this game. It's probably my favorite throw from, from Daniel Jones in this game. He just delivered it on a I rope. Like the other one better, the other Slayton ball, which we'll get to soon. But Okay, think- yeah. Either way, I just think that's it's a good ball by Daniel Jones. Like throw him with, yeah. like you said, good velocity. Like he, Also, you mentioned, man, pocket. like... Everything, every, the pocket is great here. That's why it's going to be weird to like really weigh in the, the, our grades, the superlatives for pass protection because pass protection wasn't really terrible in this game. Wasn't even close to terrible. The pass protection was probably pretty good. I mean, I don't think it was bad at all, really. There were some misses with Feliciano. What'd you say? And that they still couldn't do anything. You know, it's just, yeah, pass protection wasn't the reason they couldn't do anything in this game. That's for sure. Now we have a GT counter to Matt Breida at a shotgun. Josh Azudu almost gets uprooted on his kick out block, but just look at like the force Josh Azudu brings to the point of contact yes. right there. <laughs> and I know the defender, player. the defender gets so low and keeps everything narrow. So good on the defender, but you know, at this moment right here, the defender's like, ah, oh, crap. crap. Like, I gotta, <laughs> yeah. I got to brace myself right here. <laughs> what an animal he looks like on that. It was awesome. Um, and then you, you could also see Tanner Hudson. There's another one of those blocks by Tanner Hudson. Then I'm just like, Oh my God. Cause you need Tanner Hudson. You need Tanner Hudson to make this block right here. You have the Mike you linebacker do. who's coming right down to the play side, and he just leans in. You can see how tentative he is. Like Tanner, like look, look at that. Good point. I love Daniel how you talk, term that. Daniel Bellinger never approaches that block like that. Like this is such a good play by Brooks that Brooks avoids, swims over the top of Tanner Hudson, and by the time Matt Breida gets to the line of scrimmage, he's square to Matt Breida. Like right. That's you. We talk about losing slowly for tight ends and that's all you want like this was one of the fastest losses i've seen in quite a while <laughs> yeah it's crazy too because if he loses slowly there there might be an opportunity for Brita because 79 doesn't have a bad not, it's not doing it too bad on his block there so it's a, that's a that's one they missed for sure there that that stinks to see for sure but that puts him in the second and seventh situation um so this is i think this is the pass i was referring to this is my favorite pass of the day from daniel jones just an absolute seed in there to darius slayton Takes the snap, looks off to his right, comes back left, slides, resets, delivers the football. Absolute seed. It looks even better from the sideline angle. So two of his best, th- two of his best throws in this game came on this drive. You're starting to get into a groove a little bit. Yeah, and you see that. Wandell streaking down the field, but like this isn't one of the plays that I consider necessarily a miss by Daniel Jones because at the point where Wandell creates the leverage that he needs to to get past this safety, Daniel Jones is already dialed into Darius Slayton, who's open. So take what's right. there. Like this isn't yeah, one I'm, that I'm I would fine not. With him. I'm fine with yeah. him not throwing the vertical to to Robinson there. I you have think, a cover two type of defense here with right. two high, and you have Wando Robinson streaking down the middle of the hashes here. It kind of gets isolated against this linebacker and the safety. I don't know why the safety is so late to, to yeah, recognize. Yeah, what is this? This is a really bad play by the safety. I think it's because he's probably looking at Daniel Jones and sees Daniel Jones' eyes kind of shading towards Darius Slayton. Maybe he's anticipating Slayton to run a, a dig instead of kind of just sit out of his break. Maybe. I'm not really 100% sure, though. But that is yeah. a good throw by, by Daniel yeah, Jones. Look, and I, from, sorry, go ahead. No, no, go on. You're good. I was just going to say, look at it from the sideline angle. I think it looks like an even more impressive ball to me from the sideline angle there from Jones. Because you can just see the speed and velocity of the ball better from this angle. Because you can see there's no real window for the second level guy to close on this throw. That's what really stands out to me. The ball gets there so fast. There's no... No real window, right? He tries to close at the end. He does close that second level guy. He gets to a pretty solid depth here. Um, and so, you know, one thing about this play, Nick, I really like this route combination the Giants had here. I want to see more of this, these types of route combinations, right? Like there, there seemed to be like this right here is a perfect way, I think, to play this kind of cover two type look, right? Um, and there were yes. other times the Seahawks ran these types of coverages, and I just didn't feel like we always got these types of route combos. Look at it from an X's and O's standpoint. We'll try to paint the picture for the podcast audience. You have some sort of too high shell from the Seattle Seahawks, right? So to the 
field side, you have a three by one set. One be, the number three receiver is Tanner Hudson, but you take Wando Robinson, who's the number two, and you split the apex defender and the Mike linebacker, and you just run him directly through the split safety. Look, that's going to occupy the Mike linebacker, right? So you just have Darius Slayton, who's the outermost receiver, the number one receiver. You angle his stem outward, and then you find the soft spot between him and that safety, you just kind of curl right around him and go to the inside where that Mike linebacker was just cleared up. This is a really nice route combination against a cover two zone type of defense. And I felt like most of the successful throws that the Giants had in this game were this type of route concept. Maybe right. it wasn't the same exact one, but it was a deep curl where if it was man coverage, it was Darius Slayton winning his one-on-one. -on -one. If it was zone coverage, it was the Giants receiver finding the soft spot and, and kind of settling in Daniel Jones, noticing the coverage and then firing the football. Love how you broke that down. And I'd love to see more of these kind of vertical concepts to attack these styles of defense with creating the hole and then, you know, having Jones have the confidence to take more hole shots because that's one thing in general in his game that in my mind, I, I wish he'd do a little bit more of moving forward and kind of just over the first four years of his career, more, more hole shot opera, you know, more attempts into the hole shots. So this was a one great thing, example of it. Oh yeah. One other thing I wanted to highlight was Josh Azudu and how quick he is because it's important to know the Giants are using tempo at this point in the game and watch Josh Azudu take this twist on. He quickly knows that yeah. that three technique is slanting inside. He just transitions to the nose, stays square, gets his hands right on the breastplate. Like watch this transition, hand shoot, sit back on your hips, punch up, stay in front. Like that's a good play right there from Josh Azudu. And I was going to put some crazy good rep by him. And that's, that's the thing. It's like, not only does this, how many times you see a rookie mess this up, right? Nick, where he, they don't pick up this landing defensive line and they're too late on it. Not only does he pick it up mentally fast, he then recovers athletically too. Like you broke down. So those are the flashes we're talking about from him. Like the really right. big upside flashes. I don't want to stay forever on this play, but I do. Yeah. I just think there's so many interesting things on this play. Like even Andrew Thomas, look at Andrew Thomas right here. Like you just don't see Andrew Thomas lose anymore, but like on this rep, Bruce Irvin, who Andrew Thomas is obviously far superior than at this point of their careers. Bruce Irvin gets into Andrew Thomas's chest and kind of backs him up a little bit. And in the past, when Andrew Thomas is in this position, you've seen pass rushers work to one side of Andrew Thomas and have success right. creating separation. Like you just never see that now. Like Andrew Thomas is never losing to either of his side. Like he always stays square and planted to the defender that he's assigned to, man. And it's just one of those things that I look how quick he gets. And this is a wide alignment from Bruce, from Bruce Irvin. Look how quick he gets into that, into his set. Uh, dude, his feet are just so, so smooth. Like that was crazy to watch just when you focus and in on 78. And right he lands, he does such a good job. He lands that outside arm a lot, like on the shoulder pad, high bicep yeah. deltoid area. But then he always lands that inside arm, like underneath, right on the chest. And he just controls at that point, man. He does this so often. He's so quick and effective and efficient with his hands. It's just the development of this kid. And I love to see it because, damn, we've been together throughout this kid's career. We've watched him grow and develop and talk about it on this podcast. So seeing him be one of the best tackles in the league, it's it just puts a really bright smile on my face. It does. And he has a case this year to be known as the best tackle in the league. I think as of right now, he has the highest grade pro football focus. Me and you aren't, you and I aren't huge pro football focus guys, but at the same time, obviously we can see on tape that it aligns at this stage of it. And we don't watch every tackle. So I don't want to make any kind of proclamation from that standpoint, but I will say this, they might have the best tackle in the NFL right now in Andrew Thomas, and he certainly deserves all pro recognition. And I hope he gets it this year. One more thing I wanted to say about Azudu as we go to the next play. I was going to put something on Twitter of like all the twists that he picked up and like applaud him. But then I watched like one of those last drives and I saw him <laughs> blow a twist assignment and I was like, ah, Josh, I'm like, damn it. <laughs> yep. And then the Giants come right back after hitting a 16 yarder and they do something excellent here because they keep the rhythm going and nothing open deep down the field. And he sees that and Jones recognizes. And I think this is an adjustment by Kafka too, in my mind, because all game, and you could tell me if this is wrong. I'm curious to get your take on this. All game, the Seattle Seahawks second level was dropping to, to depth. And so what do you do? You leave it back in. And so you have the check down option, which they didn't always have in this game. Yeah, I think that was an adjustment and also might have just been a product of this specific play call down in the red zone, trying to get yourself closer in the field goal range or, or whatever. But there were a lot of times throughout this game where I was like, dude, whenever Seattle drops into a cover two zone or a cover six, they really drop to depth. They are just inviting me so to quick check down. So I was right. actually curious as to why we didn't see it a little bit more, but yeah, this might dude. Have been, yeah. 
That was the problem. They should have done this way earlier and they should have done this way more because that's how you, you can't let them just continue, like you said, to drop at that depth. And that's just, but it was good to see there at least, right? Because they picked up 12 yards. Um, and then here we have this first and 10 here. Uh, so this is kind of the play that Nick put out on his Twitter earlier. This is definitely one that I think Daniel Jones left on the field. He has to process this a bit faster and he has to hit the wide open cager for the touchdown. Yeah, so this is a design play, which I also, I love, by the way, that this coaching staff, you can see Tanner Hudson right there. Tanner Hudson is so upset, but let's go over the play first. I like how the coaching staff is designing plays for players who haven't been here too long, especially players who have a unique skill set, like a cager, who's a former wide receiver, who is really athletic. You can just kind of see how he moves. This is a fake screen to Saquon Barkley, who's aligned wide. They motion cager to Saquon Barkley's side as the number two receiver, and then they fake the screen act like Cager is going to be the stalk blocker. And then he just fades to the back pylon. It's covered very well by the safety. The safety is not fooled by this at all. So Daniel Jones, that's your first progression. That's your first read. It's a design play for Cager. It's not there. You know, you have two backside defender or two backside receivers. Tanner Hudson is on the line of scrimmage running a dig and then an underneath route, another in-breaking route from David Sills, who's just off of Tanner Hudson. So if that safety is cleared out and those underneath defenders are now paying attention to David Sills, you have that other read in the progression. If this is even in the progression, regardless if it is, you have Tanner Hudson and you should be able to compute. I, I would imagine that Tanner Hudson is open here with that safety now removed. And you can kind of see Daniel Jones look at it, right? But he just ends up seeing the B gap open and he takes the two yards that are there. But this is an easy touchdown, Dan. And look at Tanner Hudson right there. He's so frustrated that this football was not thrown. Yeah, and I would be frustrated too if I was wide open on a route. And I did say Cager earlier, but it was actually Hudson. Um, I don't know why I got that wrong. But you can even see the second level linebacker with his eyes kind of op it opens up the passing lane because he's he sets up so wide to take look at look at that second level who goes toward Barkley. And then by that point, as you pause it, the guy who's sit, standing right on the 10, that just gives that opens up the passing lane for this, which makes it wide open. Um, and I just feel like when you look at it from the end zone angle, I just again like these are squeaky clean pockets i don't know why they're i understand like this might just be what he's coached take the b gap but there's no reason to really not just sit in this pocket right here 76 is not really losing much ground and by that you could see it right there when he puts his hand up tanner hudson that's the point where you're just like throw this freaking ball right here he should really be throwing it before he puts the hand up when he gets into the break um when he gets into that zone but there's still so much time even after he puts his hand up for jones to kind of see it because at that point jones is looking right there throw it but you still have some time like i don't even see after this i still think you can make the throw right like you don't need to i guess he just wants to take the b gap and run that's fine but you still have time even though he even if he's late on this nick i still think he can complete this for a touchdown yes absolutely and like right here i'm not faulting him like tanner hudson's wide open right. coming out of his break but he was reading something else that was designed to to cager he does the fake screen he sees the linebacker expand he sees the safety take cager away but it's at this moment when he sets yeah. his feet and you have two guys coming wide open that it's just hard for me to think that you wouldn't want to throw this football and i get that maybe daniel jones is being told hey if you're not comfortable with it you have to take the two yards but if if this is a play that he's not comfortable with, what is that saying about Daniel Jones? Yeah, you have to be comfortable throwing this football into that window because there's the linebackers, there's no, the passing lane's wide open. He already has his man beat. There's no real reason. There's no, you have to be, this is one of the easiest throws you can have, I think, from a quarterback standpoint. And in addition to that, like I said, the pocket's pure. This is a pure pocket here. So there's really no reason to even escape right there. Don't even escape the pocket, dude. Like, you don't, I mean, if you want to run, that's one thing, but. There's no, the that you can't say the pressure is the reason he didn't make take this throw. So I this don't know. First, and this is a first and ten play, guys. And if we're gonna be honest, man, like how many like times do we see Daniel Jones in the red zone where it's not a designed RPO or a specifically designed play where Daniel Jones is going through multiple progressions and making the throw that he needs to against the defense that is up against him for a touchdown that might be off script from the original first read. It doesn't happen all that often. Right. Like here, the first read is Cager, right? Cager's not there. Work back to Tanner Hudson, work back to the middle of the field. You know, that deep half safety is now eliminated. And if you also knew pre-snap, you have this safety who is outside leverage on Tanner Hudson. If that was the matchup that you thought it was going to be with the underneath route also occupying, you read the zone coverage there. It's just one of those things, man, that like, I hate sitting here in a chair critiquing professional athletes. I feel like an idiot doing it, but like, that's our job. Right. Exactly. But this, this play is one of those plays that you're just like, I'm sure Daniel Jones is watching this just saying like, damn, man, I miss it. Like he'll be the first one to tell you. 
He would definitely be the first one to tell you. I know you post this on Twitter and like some people are so crazy dug in in their trenches that they're like finding ways to not blame this on the quarterback. But like, guys, if we can't even if we can't even say this is not a good play by the quarterback, then I just throw my hands up and I, I give up because I, I just think to you, to those people, nothing is a mistake by the quarterback. Everything is the receiver's fault or the O-line's fault or whatever. He's not in the progression, whatever excuse there could be for something like this. But no, man, you got it. You don't get these. It's so hard to find any windows in the red zone. You never get windows that are this wide open in the red zone, man. And as we'll see a few plays later, the Giants are forced to settle for three. So this took four, four major points off the board. Four huge points, man. And we're going to see another play that Jones misses that I also put up on Twitter. And it was received very understandably by a lot of the Giants fan base. <laughs> <laughs> it's become understandable, unfortunately. And I don't, I don't think it, I think it's just a small minority. That's really loud. Nick, um, that doesn't really allow for any critique of this team. It just always has to be, we talk about, I agree, yeah. only. but yeah. and so we shouldn't really like, I, I would be, it's better for everyone's mental health. I said this the other day, I was talking to some of our CBS guys, cause we were looking at some YouTube comments. It's better for everyone's mental health to just not check the comments and the replies. But the problem with that is I really enjoy interacting with like, 80 to 90 percent of the people who comment and reply and said and, you know you guys know who you are the people who talk and interact with me often on twitter you guys have great things to say and you expand my knowledge of the giants too by whether it's challenging me on something or where it's bringing up an excellent point like we talked about earlier with john's point about how the run game timing was off due to the crowd noise so it, it's i'm just never going to stop checking those nick it just it sucks that you know that loud, loud minority can can be loud and it's okay you can make your own comments about the giants too so it's all good Oh, hundred percent. Yeah, I don't mind that type of stuff. But here we are on on the third and seven play. This was uh, the inside whip route to Wanda Robinson that the Giants had success against Baltimore running. And here you could see Seattle and Tariq Woolen just knew exactly what was coming. Tariq Woolen, six foot five, or six foot four ish. Wandale Robinson, five foot seven, both rookies. And you could see just Tariq Woolen's movement skills are just unreal. And he tested that way at the combine. Just crazy with Tariq Woolen. He was supposed to be a project, and he's immediately not a project. He's just immediately like exactly what he could be with that, with those uh, size and skill traits. And I know we talked about it a lot in our pre-draft process when we did a lot of um, our draft content, and we liked him a lot for the Giants. He still ended up falling to day three, right? So it's like yeah. even though the NFL sees these traits, they didn't want to take a, a chance on him. I mean, who would you rather have right now, Tariq Woolen or Cordell Flott? I think that like I don't even think we can really like – no offense to Flott. He hasn't played, and I don't even think we even need to see in play to know that we'd probably rather have Woolen already, right? Yeah, but I mean, at the same time, we would have said that too. Then we'd be like, "Yeah, I don't sure. really." We didn't know much about Cordell Fly. You kind of came onto him a little bit late in the in the draft process, and I didn't like really know much about him. I watched some LSU players, so I was like, "Oh yeah, I, I saw him out there," but I didn't like do an evaluation. I don't think on him pre-draft. I'm not really certain, but I liked Tariq Woolen just because there were so much traits. And if you have a teacher, in my opinion, like Jerome yeah, Henderson. Jerome Henderson, he gets the most out of these guys, man. So you just give me the most workable piece. And as long as he's the right character and the right kid, which by all accounts, it seems like Tariq Wollin is, bring him in the building. And I think Jerome Henderson would have really developed that young man. I like the way you phrased that. And I think that's true. And that feels good to feel that about the co the coaching staff anyway, moving forward. Um, and it'll take more traits-based gambles too. This was the first class. They wanted to get in the right guys to reset the program who they knew for sure were going to be character guys. You could see it. Like they didn't take a Damone Clark who looked freaking phenomenal in his first game of the guy. I thought that dude was supposed to miss the whole season. Now he's already playing week nine for the Cowboys. Like, do you see he like reached the fastest speed of any linebacker this game? Like just insane that this dude's playing. I thought he was literally supposed to miss the whole season. And I don't know. That like, was, if he's, that's what they said. Yeah. And if he's not, then like you can get the type of guy at 176, pick 176 overall. It's just like a no brainer. Um, but yeah, hopefully they start to take those kinds of chances moving forward. And I Didn't think they Dallas were. also draft Jabril Cox in last yeah. year's draft? Another linebacker out of LSU who yep. I think he had some sort of injury maybe Same at thing. some point. They so love doing that. They've been doing that forever, the Cowboys. Jalen Smith. I mean, yeah. Yep. They, 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 and I think you always get a little edge in the draft when you take these guys who are expected to miss some time for that right upcoming season. Like this is a four year investment, right? Sometimes a five year investment. Don't focus so much on what they're going to give you year one. If you're getting insane value. And like when they took Damone Clark there, there was no one on the board who was remotely even close to the level of upside talent prospect as Damone Clark, any position at that point. Right. And it's just like, that to me seems no. like an easy gamble to me, but I, I know other people and I get it. Look, 
you want to get your guys in. Like we wouldn't have maybe like a Dane Belton type or whatever it is. And, and you know, those guys can like definitely come in, pick up the program. They're smart. They're heady. So it goes both ways. I just going forward, I'm, I'm hoping and expecting the Giants will take those kind of gambles. Let's go on to the drive eight, 12 play, 45 yard drive. Another, another one that goal. ends in a field goal. Yeah, and these are, I guess you could say, these are probably the two determining drives as far as the final score goes for the Giants because they end up, what, was 13 points in this game. Um, and, you know, you turn these two into touchdown drives and that puts another uh, eight points on the board for you. So we'll, we'll see how this one bogs down in a moment. Exactly. I, th- I think that's a, a good point too, man, because when we were watching this game, I was thinking like, hey, man, they're possessing the ball, these long drives. This is kind of the Giants recipe. They have Seattle right, right. where they want them, despite the fact that like I had no confidence in the way the Giants were playing on the offensive side of the football. But like we said, man, they just settled for six instead of 14. And that's the difference in, in football. We we know that. We don't need to harp on that. But we will look at the ways that it bogged down. The last drive we showed. Yeah, <laughs> right. And on the last drive we showed, there was a really easy solution for the Giants to score a touchdown with Daniel Jones just sees wide open Tanner Hudson. So we hope that we don't see that on this drive. And we'll get to that and see how this one bogged down in a moment here. But yeah, negative one on this first play. Yeah, it's just a counter run. And you could see how Seattle's linebackers, they see Chris Myrick coming across the formation. Everybody just fills. Saquon Barkley has nowhere to go. And then you have Nick Gates finishing his block well after the whistle and almost yeah. getting into a fight with Brooks. <laughs> Classic Nick Gates. This second 11, I think you, uh, like when I watched this play, I thought of exactly what you put in your notes, Nick, um, that you shared with me before this. And I love the idea of trying to run a wheel with your running back, but I just feel like what you said is true. San- Barkley's just never been good like with these types of routes. Barkley, I love on like a Texas route, right? Where you get him with the chance to kind of play in his foot and make a linebacker have to pick one way on a two-way go. And he, it's hard to contain Barkley on a two-way go on like an angle route. But when it's just kind of like a vertical route with Barkley, I've never really seen him do too much in the vertical game. Um, nothing great adjustment in air as a receiver uh, from a you know body control standpoint. Didn't really. And Jones gave him an opportunity on this one, right? Like this isn't an impossible, in my mind at least, Nick, and you could correct me if you think I'm wrong on this. I don't think this is an impossible ball to catch. I thought Jones put it in a spot where you can make a play on the ball potentially, but it's just not a really a route that I've seen Saquon Barkley do a good job with in his career. I... When I watched this play, Dan, I was like, oh, crap, it's going to be third and long. Like, I had no faith that Saquon Barkley was going to be able to win a 50 50 ball. Right. Like, you throw this, you throw this pass, and you hope that Saquon Barkley just uses his athletic ability to outrun the defender that's on him. And I saw the defender who was in solid position. I think it's in Cheno Nuosu. So you want to take advantage of that edge right there, right? He's an edge rusher against Saquon Barkley in space. But Cheno Nuosu, he was a really good athlete in college, and he's right in position. And I don't think Saquon Barkley has the receiving skills to go up, climb the ladder, make a 50-50 catch. And that's not a knock on him. Not a lot of running backs do. Like you have like the Alvin Kamara's and and players like that. No one can do that. Saquon Barkley is not that type of player. You get him the football in space and allow him to use his God-given gifts to make people miss. But I just thought this was one of those plays where I'm like, I get what they're trying to do, but I, I didn't have faith in it right when Jones dropped back. Or you use him like Jonathan Stewart said when we had the Panthers preview podcast. You, you know, remember he said during his rookie season he was just toasting linebackers in one on ones. Um, yeah. Back on angle routes over the middle when you give him the two way go. Uh, but anyway, sets up this third and long where once again we have a really nice conversion here. This is a third and 11, I believe. A really nice conversion by the Giants on another third and long here. Another pin per- picture perfect pocket for Jones. Look at that. There's not even a, an ounce of pressure on this. There's also not really anyone open. So this was just an incredible individual play by Darius Slayton. And I want to give him his flowers here, Nick, because everyone hyper focuses on the drops. But what about when a receiver makes an insanely good individual play like this one to adjust to this ball after slipping out of his break? Now, I don't know if he was slipped or he kind of looked to me when I watch it like the defender kind of put his hand on his back and kind of aided that slip to the ground. But regardless, he gets back up off the ground, adjusts to the football that's coming at him, and then after that adjustment, like right there, I kind of thought I saw a right hand, but I don't know. It's tough to see from this angle. I mean, there's contact, but I, I think it's more Darius slipping. But it sure. does seem like Tariq Woolen, Tariq Woolen's all over Darius Slayton here. Like the fact that the Giants were able to complete this pass on third and long, high leverage situation, it's a testament to A, the offensive line for blocking really well. Yes. Andrew Thomas just takes Nuosu and just rides him right into the ground. Tariq Woolen all over Darius Slayton. So great job by Darius Slayton to get up after kind of slipping out of his break, whether it was initiated by Woolen or not. It's still a great job by Slayton to make a contested catch. And then a solid ball, I would say, overall by Daniel Jones, who steps into this pocket and delivers 
this right on the inside shoulder, which is kind of where Wallen ends up. But initially, I think when Jones throws his football, Wallen is to the outside. So I think he was trying to throw Slayton a more advantageous ball. Yeah, agreed. And it also comes in with a nice, a lot of velocity, which is important on a throw like this. And I just think the play is made by Slayton. He adjusts this ball really well and even creates yards after the catch, which is just great individual play by Darius Slayton. Kudos to him. Third and he had an 11 conversion, man. I mean, that, that's a, that's one of the best offensive plays the Giants had all night. Yeah. Or game, and I should say. I think Slayton had the best game he's had this season. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I'd agree with that. Um, there, there were a couple others, though. Like, Darius yeah. Slayton has been pretty solid so far, but all things considered, the Giants couldn't yeah, get anything else right. going. Yeah, but so just from that standpoint, I guess, yeah. So that's a nice conversion, think- and it sets up a first and 10 counter run that we're about to show and just look at Seattle and what they do to key in on the sniffer that H back and just how they know what the giants are doing here. Like Seattle had the giants figured out at this point. They all just go right to the play side and Saquon still just makes like four people miss and ends up getting dragged down. But look at 25, 25 sees Tanner Hudson motion. Brooks motions, they all just go right to the play side, follow all the pullers, know what's coming. Play went away for a second, but it's just one of those things where Seattle had their number in terms of figuring out what the hell the New York Giants were doing. And the fact that the Giants were able to get two yards on this play, fully on Saquon Barkley. Yep. And then after that, this is this that this is the second down and eight, correct? Or no, that was the first down still. So. After that, the Giants run second and eight. So I just want to ask you a question about where we're at right now as an offense in this game, Nick. Um, They try to run the pitch. It doesn't go anywhere, whatever. It's a a loss of one. Seattle plays it great. There were a ton of first down runs in this game from the Giants and a ton of second and long runs from the game in the Giants, despite the fact that nothing really changed on Seattle's front. They were still playing just as disciplined in the run game. They're still making excellent stops in the run game. So I guess my question to you would be, what happened there? Like, did, did the Giants maybe make a mistake by going so run heavy on these early downs um, and on these second and long situations? And I don't want to skip past this pa- this passing play because it's a good one. But I just before we get into more plays, I want to ask you your thoughts on kind of the play calling in this game because this was the first one I wasn't really fully on board uh, with Kafka just because it's just again just too much too many running too many run calls on second and long and first down. It did seem like that. I mean, the Giants couldn't do anything through the air, and sure. I'm also curious if because the Giants suffered, what, four false start penalties up until this point? Yeah, true. A lot of these false start penalties tend to happen when you're passing the football and you're going backward. And I'm wondering true. if that had anything to do with it. It's something that I would I would like to ask as well, because I'm not really 100% certain as to why it happened, but there were a lot of frustrating second and eight runs, a lot of just running in general. I mean, Saquon Barkley is your best player, right? And some of these fronts, it's not like, Seattle has eight guys in the box all the time. A lot of these fronts, they, they have like two safeties. So it seems like an advantageous front, but geez, man, nothing was there. That post snap, yeah. everybody rotated down and then yep. Seattle just played it so damn well. There was no margin for error for the New York Giants offensive line and their blockers. If one guy missed up their assignment, the play was dead. Like it was just blown up. And that was kind of my thing. It's like, it wasn't like that, like you, you do, you broke it down great, Nick. It wasn't like they were facing stack boxes, but they knew already based on their first half that they were facing a defense that was taking away everything they wanted to do in the run game. And yet you still see like the second and uh, whatever it was, second and eight, they try to run the pitch again. And it's just like not even close to there. The first down, they try to run the counter and it's not even cl- with the, again, like you said, with the sniffer, it's not even close to working. And it just felt like despite the maybe quote unquote, not advantageous boxes, they didn't really get any advantageous boxes, but despite the okay, like like neutral boxes that you maybe you can run in. They should have known that this just wasn't going to work in this game, this specific game. It just wasn't there for them, right? Like Seattle was playing it perfectly almost all game. And I know part of it is like in the past, the Giants have had a lot of success in the second half going run heavy in these games because they're in tight games. They end up winning in the fourth quarter. Barkley t- kind of bails them out. As Barkley said last week, when it played a big role in the Jacksonville win, he's like toward the end of the game, I can kind of feel the defense being worn down, right? But this wasn't an example of that, right? Like it wasn't like the Giants were wearing down this defense at all. Um, and I'm sure they felt that too in the run game because they weren't really creating much up front from a blocking standpoint. So I just feel like there wasn't a great adjustment, I guess I would say, to what how the game was actually playing out. I know, look, you look at the pass and you say, okay, let's lean on the run game late in the game because it's been working to give us wins. But that doesn't always work. Um, you know, it, it, it depends on the matchup. And I think in this one, they probably should have went away from it. And they were also 
plays throughout the season or to sequences of plays throughout the season where where the Giants tried to run the football a lot, like you said, in the second half. But they would get four yards. They would get five yards. Like There hasn't been many sequences this season where the Giants ran twice consecutively and they got nothing. You know, right? It, yeah. So like now it's starting to happen against Seattle. It's like, well, how are you going to adjust off that? You can't really use Daniel Jones's legs. And that's pretty much accounted for. You have to just come up with something different. And I'm wondering, obviously there are passing plays in the game plan, but it did seem like the Giants were a little reluctant to, to air the football out. They wanted to control the clock. This was still a one score game at this point. They wanted to really follow the same formula that they've followed over the last, what, right. eight games essentially. But sometimes you got to stray from that. But it's difficult That's to do exactly that when right. when you don't have the wide receivers, when your quarterback isn't playing all that well. When I don't even want to say the offensive line is playing bad because they were playing pretty yeah, well, but, <laughs> pretty damn good. But it, was, but it was a hostile environment, regardless. So I'm guessing all of those things. That's probably a little bit of all of it. But it was uh, something that I hope in the future they, when the run is completely shut down. I get sticking with it. There's some merit to that, but sometimes you need to have some sort of adjustments where that's just an indictment right. on a lot of pieces of your team. You can't be so one dimensional. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then we'll get to this right now, right? We can go right into this third and nine. This was another really big missed opportunity for the giants. Um, their third of the game, the cager, the, the cager throw earlier, the Hudson throw in the red zone. And then this one here. So look, great play by Chris Myrick post catch here. But this is also a missed tackle here. And so this check down should usually not work. It should usually be tackled right at the catch point here for the most part. Um, and, you know, no no first down. This is an excellent play in my mind individually by Chris Myrick. But this is what the defense wants you to do. The defense wants you to check it down. But take a look at the top of your screen if you're watching on YouTube. Because Darius Slayton is going to run a double move. And what I want you to focus on is the corner, right? before and and right after the snap look at just the position the corner is in look at his feet look at where his head is look at where his body is and understand that if you're running a double move against a cornerback in that position there's almost no possible way he can cover a double move and he doesn't Darius Slayton toasts him with almost four and a half yards of separation but Daniel Jones does not pull the trigger on this throw and you can see the pocket once again perfectly fine a really good pocket yeah there's a little bit of pressure here from the right side i guess at the end and andrew thomas gets moved back a tiny bit but man there's these are if you're pin pick, nit picking a pocket like this then you just haven't <laughs> watched too much football in the nfl because most pockets that are considered bad don't look anything like this so i would really love to see personally nick and i want to get your take on this i would love to see daniel jones throw this with anticipation and get the ball out right when slayton right before slayton gets into his break because he can recognize based on where the the cornerback cornerback's leverage and cornerback's positioning that it's going to be again really hard for this corner to defend a double move so you get that ball out all early throw it with anticipation and then you hit it and it's a touchdown because look at where the safety rotates post snap the safety is taken out of the play by that Wando Robinson route i think that's Robinson and so man there's just that's a touchdown they left on the board and this is a 50 yarder it's a huge opportunity that is missed by the Giants. And it wasn't just the safety being eliminated by Wandell Robbins. And this is respect paid to Wandell Robbins. And people being like, oh, why didn't Wandell Robinson do anything? Well, it's because on a lot of high leverage situations, there were situations like this where pre-snap, Seattle is in a too high shell. And you have the three eligible receivers with the wing back, which is Chris Myrick who ends up catching the pass. So you have... Basically, both of those cornerbacks are in outside leverage, specifically Tariq Wollin, who bites on this double move. But watch how the safety just goes and they bracket Wandell Robinson. You have the underneath defenders take him. Everybody drops to a depth. Now Wandell Robinson has two versus one right there. And that's confirmed by Daniel Jones at the snap. If you look at it from the end zone angle, you can see Daniel Jones looks at that safety to see exactly what he's doing right when he catches the football right here. See, he's looking in the middle of the field. He sees what the safeties are doing. The safety goes inside and kind of matches the destination of Wandell Robinson. That right there tells you you have a one-on-one -on -one matchup to the outside. And I love, love this route by Darius Slayton because the beauty is in the detail, right? Darius Slayton, where is he starting this route from? He is at the bottom of the numbers. Let's see that stem. He goes to the top of the numbers. And what does that do? Against a cornerback that has outside leverage, that cornerback is going to go inward because he's anticipating some sort of dig, some sort of in-breaking route, right? You can see right there, bottom of the numbers top of the numbers. And then right when he gets to the 40 yard line, he breaks to the outside. And at that point, Tariq Wollin is essentially 
stacked directly on top of him, about a yard off of him. So he is not in a position to guard any kind of outside route. So Tariq Wallen has to flip his hips. And then by that point, Darius Slayton just goes out and up. Beautiful route, execution, and call by Mike Kafka. And you can see right here, I'm going to pull it up again because it just went away. Daniel Jones's eyes are on Darius Slayton. But for whatever reason, he doesn't pull the trigger, man. And and this, this is a conversion. It's third and nine. Great, like you said, individual effort by Chris Myrick. But you're down some points right here. This this is just a, a terrible missed opportunity by Jones in the offense. And you can see there's some hesitation right here, it seems like, with Daniel right. Jones. Like, he's looking, he's looking, he's looking. He's like, all right, I'm just going to take this check down. There was a lot of hesitation by Jones in this game to pull the trigger on downfield throws. And that's kind of the thing that stands out to me about why I thought this was a, a big regression game for him, in my mind at least, after a really good four-game stretch. Just because of that thing right there, like, look, this drive ends in a in a field goal. Like, it's great to convert first downs here, and honestly, I just don't think this is a good decision, regardless, because the the guy breaks. Like, this, this is a checkdown. This is what the defense wants. It's just a missed tackle right here. A missed tackle. That should be that he's he attempts that tackle four yards before the sticks. But ultimately, you get the first down. But what ends up happening? They bog down at the end of this drive, and not even at the end. A few plays later, and you have to settle for a long field goal instead of taking that shot to Darius Slayton. There, and really, it's really hard to mess that up because, as you already broke down, Nick, he gets like four and a half yards separation, and the safety's accounting for Wondell Robinson. Um, so yeah, you just want him to pull the trigger on these. I did like the only thing I did like about this breakdown is one thing that uh, you know now we can talk about is part of the reason Wondell Robinson had such a slow game is because, and you saw it earlier when he got bracketed on that other third and long, like the defense already in game two is paying this much attention to Wondell Robinson. A hundred percent. And I understand why too, is Wondell Robinson is really exciting when he has the football in his hands and he's the most dangerous weapon, not named Saquon Barkley on this offense. But right here, Darius Slayton, like Daniel Jones knows the play. Daniel Jones hits his back foot right here. And at this moment, where it's Actually, paused. The ball should be out. Yep. The ball should be out at this moment. Tariq Wollen is not getting over there. You know the safety is on Wandale Robinson. So throw this football. But look at the corner's there. position. Look at when you go go back to that still shot if you can, Nick. Look at the when this is where the ball should be out. And just look at the corner's position. There's just no possible way with his legs like that <laughs> and with his body facing in the direction it's facing for him to recover here. And that's the thing. Like you could you could say, oh, it's just one play. This happens on tape and stuff like that with all the quarterbacks. But man, they're really good quarterbacks. If you if you want Daniel Jones to be the guy that's going to win this franchise Super Bowls, then he has to have the anticipation to let this ball loose. Yes, exactly. There's no reason really not to. I mean, some quarterbacks, Nick, I've seen let the ball loose in this situation with a potential safety to make the play on it. Like this safety is taken completely out of contention here. There's no even worry about the safety. But I've seen some quarterbacks throw it in between the safety in these spots, just being like, you know what? This double move is going to win against this corner. I'll take a chance. I'll put it toward the sideline and see if I can put it away from that safety. He doesn't even have to worry about the safety on this one. That's the thing that, that bothers me kind of the most. It's like, what are you worried about here if you're Jones and as far as not throwing this ball? Yeah, it's, it's unfortunate, man. I mean, you have this cover six type of look it looks like possibly with the paying attention to Wandale Robinson and they gave you they gave you a chance, but the Giants just didn't oblige. They just didn't take advantage. You can see Darius Slayton frustrated, throwing his hands up in the air, not in a not in like a Jeremy Shockey manner, but just a, out of man, I had him beat there. <laughs> Could have easily have been six. And go to the end zone angle real quick and run the play through real quick. There's one other inter interesting observation I had about this play. I think you can see it from the end zone angle, but I'm not sure if you can. So let's run it through. This could be bad radio. Um, we will take a look in a second to see if I see what I thought I saw on the giant sideline. Let's see in a second. Uh, no, this is actually not going to be the angle. I don't think regardless, I don't think we're going to be able to uh, figure this one out. So we'll, we'll just move on. Are you talking about Brian Dable on the sideline? Yeah. 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 You see it right here. You can't, you can't see him glance twice towards Slayton, though. That's the thing. He takes he takes a look left twice on the play first when Slayton first yeah, makes look. the 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 move. And then at the end, uh, once the ball's released to once Daniel Jones decides to check down, he looks back one more time to the left to see Slayton. This is a third and nine conversion right here. Does the head coach of the New York Giants look pleased? 
look at him on the sideline. He looks right there. You could see him looking at Darius Slayton. Everybody's celebrating. He just walks and kind of looks at Daniel Jones and walks the other direction. He did not look pleased there. And I know this is very Kim Kardashian of us to be reading yeah. into it this way. But at the same time, I feel like there's You're going to take there. a lot of heat for saying that, but I don't care because I think there's something there too, especially when you see from the other angle that he, and it's hard to see on our, our view now, but when you have the big screen, like when you put it on the monitor, he looks twice at that Slayton route. He looks first when Slayton makes the break, his first break. And then he looks again once the ball is thrown to kind of confirm how open is Slayton. And then, as you say, there's no celebration. So I don't want to go too, you know, Kardashian here with, with it, but I think it's pretty obvious. Everyone knows that ball should have been released to Slayton there. Yeah, it's a mistake. And like, like Dan and I say all the time on the podcast, every quarterback misses throws. Okay. Sure. So it's something that happens a lot. It's just in, in those types of situations, you want to see him really rise to the occasion because that's an explosive play through the air and explosive plays through the air is, aren't necessarily something that come easy to this Giants offense. And I think that's the key for me, Nick. It's that we have such a small margin for error on offense that when we have these opportunities, I really want to take a chance to take them. That's that's kind of what it comes down to for me. Uh, nuts and bolts of it. It's just, look, we don't have these opportunities often. We're playing great defense. We're holding teams to low to point totals throughout basically every game except for this one. This was like the most points I think anyone scored on the Giants this year. So these kind of plays can change outcomes of games uh, when you connect on a play like that. And the other thing is, you know, everyone talks about why don't the Giants take shots downfield? You know what? The, 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 you know, the default from everyone is they don't have the receivers, right? They don't have the receivers to create separation. Well, that's not the, the you can't say that about this play, right? Like you can't even come close to saying it. you can't say it about the cager play either. There's plenty of separation on both those plays down the field. Um, and, and, you know, on one of them, the quarterback did make the throw, but on this one, the quarterback just didn't decide to make the throw. And I think that has, it's not like this is the first time I've seen this happen. And I think you would agree with that too. I do. And then we're going to have a halfback misdirection covered very well by the Seattle Seahawks. See the Giants, a big personnel. You have Nick Gates in there, jumbo personnel with a tight end to his side. Seattle's defenders are everywhere there. Daniel Jones opens to the weak side, goes to the strong side, little counter run, no rushing room. Run game bottled up to set up a second and eight. Yep. Second and eight here. The Giants actually find it, find some success here uh, in the run game. Yeah, I like this play. It's to the boundary, so you're running something a little bit different. You get guys going into space, a little bit of pin pull. Saquon Barkley drives his legs through Tariq Wallen. I wish he could cut it up field here, but there was the presence of this Neil character who's just everywhere in this <laughs> game, just kind of removing that as an option. So he just follows behind the block and takes the, Tariq Wallen for a ride. This ends up going for 10 yards, so one of their better plays on offense. Yeah, one of their few good plays on the day, um, and that was great. Sets up a first and 10, and this is kind of where it all bogs down. They have this weird play where they – I didn't really even know what happened on this play, but the penetration for Bruce Urban is absurd. Um, just blows up the play, and this screws up the whole drive. This is an eight-yard loss. They actually had some momentum going, and this kills the drive, basically. Dude, this is a counter pitch that I think would have been a huge play if Bruce Urban doesn't blow it up here because the Giants are pulling three guys – from the backside, they're pulling the backside guard, they're pulling both of the H backs here. So they have basically two sniffers with Cager on the line of scrimmage in 13 personnel. And Saquon Barkley opens up to the backside of the play. Daniel Jones pitches it to him. Saquon Barkley catches it like he's going in the direction to the backside, but ends up cutting back to the play side. It's just nobody blocks Bruce Irvin, who just like all game, he was taught just to run directly at the quarterback, runs directly at Daniel Jones, hits Daniel Jones into Barkley, and Barkley falls for a loss of eight yards. But if we look at this from the sideline angle, Dan, I think Saquon Barkley hits a really big run here behind these blocks. This is a, this was a nice adjustment by Kafka. And I don't think we've, we haven't seen this play yet this season. Yeah. Because... Yeah. It's blocked up really well. Glowinski kicks out the end man on line of scrimmage. Then you have Chris Myrick who takes that scraping linebacker. No other defender is anywhere near the boundary. And like we always say, the Giants like to run to the field side a lot. They'll do some boundary runs here and there, but they have a tendency to run to the field side. This time they pull everybody to the boundary side and they use that little counter element off of it, little misdirection element off of it. It's just Bruce Irvin blows the play up. I think this ends up going, this could have went for a touchdown, if I'm going to be honest with you, if that safety doesn't get to Saquon Barkley. Yeah, with Barkley, that can definitely go for a touchdown, right? He has the speed to get to the edge. Um, so it was a really well-designed play. Just unfortunately, one component of it screws the whole thing up with Bruce Irvin. Seems to be the story of this game, right? Yeah, you're right. He just kept going after Jones no matter what. Um, penetration, all game. So now we have a second and 18 here after this play, which we'll get to where Seattle just says, F it, 
It's second and 18. We're dropping eight. <laughs> so just drop eight in coverage here. It's tough to beat anything. Drop eight in coverage. There's nothing really open. Like you could have maybe hit that quick in breaker to Robinson, I guess, but nothing, nothing there. Jones tries to make actually a throw on the run to his left here. Um, ball placement just off and toward the sideline. Yeah. To Matt Breida, he just overthrows him, but that's not really a throw. I expect Daniel Jones to make. Not it's really tough. Jones, no. Yeah. Yeah. It's tough for really any quarterback too. any and quarterback, but the Mahomes and Allen types are not making that throw. Probably. Third and 18, though, I like this play call by Kafka. Just ensure that you get in a reasonable field goal position. Halfback screen to Matt Breida. Well-timed. Yep. Breida picks up 10 yards to set up the field goal by Graham Gano. But that's the difference, right? Because the first drive that they settled for three before this, they missed the Hudson open touchdown. This drive, they missed the Slayton open touchdown. And, and you know, those reads end up costing them big in this game. And we're not here to say no quarterbacks have these plays, but we are here to say that this was a small margin game. That the, and every game for the Giants is small margin. So they get a few opportunities in the passing game every game. They got to try to take them uh, moving exactly. forward. And, and they know that. It's not like this is not like we're not we're not dropping any knowledge on the giants. Like when they watch that on film, they're going to come to the same conclusion. It's not like Daniel Jones is going to watch them and be like, yeah, I made the right decision to bail it out of that pocket. Uh, when, when Hudson in the red zone or yeah, I made the right decision to check down. He knows like they're going to tell him there's no, there's a right and wrong answer here. You guys can debate it all you want, but to be honest, there pretty much is a right and wrong answer that I think Jones himself and the coaches would admit. So it is what it is there, but obviously it leaves points on the board. Um, now we go to this ninth drive here. It's another three and out for the giants here. Um, first play again, just look at how well they play the, the play action boot. Yep. Bruce Irvin just runs directly at Daniel Jones. Daniel Jones outruns him, but he gets kind of extended and misses possible throwing windows. But even if you look at the defender right here, number 30 Jackson, how he just sinks and turns yeah. towards Lawrence Cager's route and has his eyes on David Sills coming across the middle of the field, just good technique closing towards the sideline. There's just really not a lot Daniel Jones can do off the play action pass right here. It's so weird to me, Nick, watching like this play because you broke that down so well and like all the plays we've gone over so far. It's so weird to me that the Seahawks defense struggled until the last three weeks of the season. Like maybe it was all just communication issues or there were injuries I don't know about. But when I watch this defense on film, I'm like, this is one of the most disciplined, smartest defenses, both against the run and pass that I've seen all year. Like, I, I don't know how this was such a bad defense until the last few weeks. No, <laughs> neither do I. And honestly, this weird. is a solid read by Daniel Jones. Once yes. Daniel Jones sees this this defender kind of run directly at him and commit to Daniel Jones's legs. He throws the football to Sills. It's just a little bit too late and Sills can't get his feet in bounds. It's I don't really put that on Sills either. It's just a tough play to make. Yeah. And I think it originally is designed for the whole shot earlier that you said like 30 was dropping into. It would have been a tough throw anyway, but it's hard to tell because it is boot. But um, yeah, just timing is all screwed up. Good read at the end by Jones, but just uh, end up getting nothing out of this. So we move and on. And the score to... is 20 to 13 at this right. point for context. So this is an important drive right here for the Giants who try another halfback counter type of run. Saquon Barkley gets the ball. He runs right into a defender. Like It's so another we... second and long run call. Yeah. After at least trying to pass on first down and then that's the thing. That's like the I catch don't rather run on first. I, I, it's more egregious to me, Nick, when you run on second and long than first and long. I'm okay running on first and long, especially this type of offense they have. Um, second and long to me is just a no go down for running the ball. This does this, this, and the stats all show it. Like it's literally it's known as the worst play call in football because the analytics on it show that it gains the least yards per play when you decide to run on second and ten. No, yeah, of course that's something that. Has been kind of a topic of conversation. Oh so yeah, <laughs> last few coaching, coaching staff. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And that's the catch twenty two when you do throw on first down, as you get put in second and ten. And at that point, it's like, do you just commit to the pass because running on second and ten isn't necessarily the most uh, the best option all of the time? But For here, me, the Giants, nasty. because I feel like the yeah. Giants even earlier in the game, you know, they showed like they can come out and throw three times, um, and not this game. There have been other games they did that. Jacksonville is a great Damn, example. Man. That first drive. Look at 93 right here, Shelby Harris and what he does to Josh Azudu. So this is a shotgun counter run where the sniffer comes across the formation to kick out. And just look at how disciplined Boye Mafe is to pinch, block down, step down rules. He sees Andrew Thomas go to block down. He steps down and he just takes on 
one of the lead blockers and Mark Lewinsky, just absolute traffic jam right there. Nowhere for Saquon Barkley to go. 56 Brooks just scrapes right over the top, positions himself outside of Chris Myrick, who just runs into space with really no one there. You have two guys blocking 57, and then you have Shelby Harris just blowing up Josh Azudu and just making that rushing lane non-existent. This is just, I, I hate to usher so much praise towards the Seattle Seahawks defense, but holy shit, man, they played well. Played really well, and it's again super surprising given where they were at earlier this season, I guess. But um, you know, teams change, teams get better. Here's a third and nine play, some deep concepts, pretty good pocket original initially. Um, obviously Tyree gives up, Tyree Phillips gives up a little bit of pressure at the end there, uh, and just nothing downfield. From my vantage point, when I saw this on the all twenty two sideline view, Nick, I'm like, I have no idea where Jones is supposed to go with the ball here. Um, and as you can see. From that angle, there's really nothing. And so he decides to run, take the edge, but it's a great play by, I think, who was that Seattle lineman who ran him down? I think it was Shelby Harris. Shelby Harris, Harris yeah. And that's the guy they got from Denver. It's also, man, I don't love the play call, man, because these are okay. three really long developing routes. Right. You might hear some barking in the background. It's Halloween, so I'm sure kids are trick-or-treating. I'm not a total curmudgeon, but I'm not giving them candy at the moment. Someone else will, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> I have work to do, but Just make sure that if you are presented with a situation, you do give him candy. You don't want to pull a Larry David and, and uh, have your house TP'd. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I'm going to try not to have my, my house TP. That would suck. A lot of, a lot of trash to clean up, but like, I like Wando Robinson splitting the safeties, right? You carry that middle linebacker vertical. So you have three guys basically focusing on him. And then you have like two deep curl routes, but there's nobody over the middle of the field here, man. And I'm wondering if these are choice routes by by Johnson and and um, Slayton. I'm not really 100% certain how that works, like just reading the leverage. Because you can even see Marcus Johnson. He has outside leverage to begin. He wins inside. And then he bends like he's going to go to the sideline. Then he cuts back inside and then flows back outside because 27 right. sets to his inside. And I'm wondering if that is some sort of adjustment that he makes during the play, not really a hundred percent sure, but there's really no one in the middle of the field. And then Jones is flushed to one side where he has two routes, but Shelby Harris just makes a great individual effort. We would be giving him a lot of praise if he was a giant, like we do with Dexter Lawrence. Yeah, it's a great point. And I agree with you. That's not a great route combination. You don't want to ever have just nothing over the middle of the field on, on a third and nine situation there. Um, too long to develop. Especially with a clear out of Wando yeah, Robinson. Yeah, right. You already have the clear out with Robinson. So don't you want an in-breaker behind that? Like, I don't know. I don't, yeah, I would think. I don't know. But didn't work. <laughs> Obviously, the Giants had to punt there. So like you said, it's 20 to 13, and they're forced to go three and out. And I believe that's when they fumbled, their second fumble by Richie James, which led to a quick touchdown by the Seahawks to go up 27-13. So now we're picking up on this nine-play 46-yard drive that was down 27 to 13 times ticking in the game here. I think they have like five minutes left. So if they got, if they're going to win this game, they got to score and they got to score fast. And so um, that, that they end up turning it over on downs, but it starts off with a really nice player. One of their best passing plays of the game. Yeah. The first play goes for three yard run, just the fast yeah, three quarterback run seven. RPO tag, nothing, but 27 yard gain to Tanner Hudson over the middle of the field. I like the route concept, just, just high, low, just drive concept, right? You have a deep dig. And then you have the drag who just kind of sits against zone and Tanner Hudson ends up picking up a nice chunk of yards to set up uh, this first and 10 where we're going to see Josh Azuto on another good twist pickup. Yeah. And on that play, once again, another example, Wondell Robinson clearing out for the Giants, which is something that he was kind of used to do a lot in this game. And it worked out. A lot of split safety looks. Occupy those safeties, yeah. carry that linebacker, try to hit routes in the middle of the field. I mean, that's generally the thought process. And there you see Josh Azudu. They run it's a kind twist. Of a crazy from, thing too, though, right, Nick? So many slip, split safety looks and yet nothing available in the run game. Just kind of wild. Yeah, and that's it's just a testament to Seattle's defensive front and their linebackers, Basically. really, because it wasn't even just like there were plays where Giants' offensive line got absolutely. I'm just going to run through these plays, by the way, on YouTube. Sure. Got absolutely like bitched, right? But there were also plays where it wasn't like that. Like the Giants' offensive line, they were in position, but then the linebackers were in a better position and the force, the giants offensive lineman to have basically no errors whatsoever, you know? And exactly. it was like we said, there was just no margin for error here. And there's Saquon Barkley dropping an easy pass. It's frustrating to see. I do want to focus in on the third and 10 situation. Uh, when we get to that, I believe it was a 13 yarder to Hudson. Yeah. Hudson getting some use on this, on this drive. I believe it's this one right here. Yep. So let's flip to the sideline angle. So before you run this play, you can pause it uh, if you don't mind just to set it up. So at this point, there's 427 left in the game. The Giants are down two touchdowns. In my mind, if I'm down two touchdowns here, 
if I have any opportunity to take a shot at the end zone at any point left in this game, I'm probably going to take it just because I know I'm down so many scores. Time is working against me. And I want to be able to score quickly, potentially, so I give myself a better chance. If you score with 437 left, for example, to cut into a one-score game, now you, you can kick that off fully. You don't need to worry about an onside kick. You can even give up like one or two first downs, potentially, with all your timeouts, get the ball back, and have an opportunity. So let's see an example here of potentially, now it's not like the one earlier with Slayton, but another example where I just wish Jones would pull the trigger and not take, look, it's still a good game. 13 yards to Hudson, great. But take a look at his eyes here. He even kind of looks for a quick, quick second. You'll see it better from the end zone angle at at the route. It seemed like um, right there. You see that kind of like hitch. It's kind of very subtle, but you can kind of see him kind of like. And I actually reran this Nick on the end zone and didn't notice it as much as I noticed it there. Just the jerk of his sh- of his right shoulder um, kind of back. But let's see right there. I thought, but it looked like then from that angle that maybe he was just noticing Hudson open. But take a look from the sideline angle at what he potentially has with Darius Slayton down the field if he wants to pull the trigger. Because this is just kind of an example. If you pull this trigger here, and and we can run it back a little. Let's see. It's right Right there. there. Yep. Pull the trigger on that. There's no safety. It's a tough throw. This is a much tougher throw than the others. The thing that sucks is there is a safety. It's just a safety squat. He he doesn't doesn't drop to any sort of depth. You have another safety from the backside, which I'm not overly worried about. Should have been some sort of pass interference on Wando Robinson over the middle of the field that was not called because Wando Robinson just gets tackled in the middle of the field out of his break right there. Like that's You don't get a worse DPI than that, but at this point, like the Giants offense hasn't really done anything, so I'm not sitting there yeah. you know, crying over this type of spilt milk, but he legit just tackles Wando Robinson. That's not feet getting tangled up. That's I just got beat because that's a really nasty little stem right there by Wando Robinson. You see how he sells like he's going vertical? You can see how that momentum of the – of this defender goes vertical and then he just grabs Wando Robinson's hips and tackles. him when he realized it's going to be a lateral type of play from Wando, but the safety squats and you have Darius Slayton run right past him on this dagger concept. The safety just kind of takes a dig and Darius is wide open, but it was just a clear out for Tanner Hudson. And that's where Daniel Jones's eyes went. I don't think this one is nearly as egregious as the other two. I'm not exactly sure what Daniel Jones yeah, is being. It's not even close to as egregious as the other two. And I don't, I don't, I'm not trying to say that either, Nick, but I'm just trying to say, man, we're down 14. Take it. I just want to, I want him to be a little bit more aggressive in his decisions, right? Like the read might be, you're right. The read probably there is Slayton's the clear out and you can just have Tanner Hudson open and I get it. So he wants to take what's open. But you're down so much that if you instead decide there to go deep to Darius Slayton and take a chance, what's the worst that can happen? The safety squats, like you said. So maybe the ball's overthrown, or if it's underthrown, maybe he can even make a play on it. Uh, or maybe you miss the throw. It's, not, it's a low percentage throw anytime you go down the field. But I just kind of wish his eyes were a little bit more down the field in this type of situation when you're when you're down so many points and there's so little time left. Yeah, it's it's one of those ones that he he probably looks on the film and wanted back like several other throws in this game, but I don't know exactly what he's being told and if he's yeah. even being told to challenge that safety when he does sit like that. You don't typically see safeties just sit like usually they yeah, drop they rob weird. or they drop to a depth. You know, that was then, weird safety play for sure. Tyree Phillips gets beat on the second and one for the sack, which sets up a third and seven. Yeah, it was a good recovery by Jones there because it was a sack fumble, but he recovered his own fumble. Yeah. At this point in the game, it's like, oh man, I guess the, uh, I guess it's all lost, right? You could see I mean, they still had some time left, but, um, yeah, I mean, that was actually a good read here too by Jones on this play, but Slayton just slipped out of his break, but it was, that's like, that's a high level read to make that throw instead of some of the others that were open or available. I love I some of the subtleties to, to Slayton's route running. And I know it's probably been taught by Tyke Tolbert and Mike Rowe. But still, man, like the angling outward towards the numbers right here, get 30 to expand, get him to the expand, get him to expand, angle back upward, and now just cut back inside. I don't know why he falls here, but he just gets caught up by the turf monster. And that should have been completed with three defenders. That should be a dig, catch, get tackled for like a five-yard gain from this safety more than likely. But you have three defenders around you. Love this play by Daniel Jones. But again, the Giants just were, one thing went wrong on a play and the Giants just weren't talented enough to overcome it. Yep. And now here we have the final play, the fourth and seven here. Uh, Jones almost gets picked by the underneath defender who makes a good play on it, but drops the interception here. Um, Look, is there potentially an opportunity to hit Wando Robinson? Maybe, but I mean, at this point, it doesn't really matter, really. Um, And I don't know, it's a very dejected feeling when when you're when you're throwing that ball over the middle, it's almost picked. um, And that's that's the end of downs on this drive. 
Yeah, it was a rough game. And then there was only, I think, six more drives. We'll run through it and we can even talk yeah, we can show it. if you want. Yeah, let's let's throw it to the superlatives while we do that. I will say this, though, and I said it on the Reaction Podcast, and I stand by it. I do not like the decision by Brian Dable to have Daniel Jones and the starting offense minus Saquon Barkley out here. The first play, he gets brought to the down uh, to the ground there, Jones. And you're going to see on one of these other plays coming up as we run through them, he gets hit really hard, Jones. And there's just nothing to gain when there's only a minute left in the game and you're down two touchdowns from your own 10-yard line to have your starters out. I'm sorry, there is no... There is no miracle. You're not scoring two touchdowns in one minute from your own 10 yard line. It's just and not happening. Similar to the Dane Belton play that we're going to break <laughs> that we're going to break down soon that we talked about. This was probably an interception that was bailed out by a PDU. I think Jackson yes. intercepts this pass right oh, here yeah. to Mark Johnson. That. And look, man, at this point, Seattle just been all over the New York Giants. Like they're a well coached, well prepared team. What have the Giants had success with? These little quick curl routes, right? You can see yep. 30 is just anticipating it right here. He sees the yep. turn. He's going to work right back underneath, and he knows it, man. He's pissed. Well said. Yeah, he is pissed because he knows he had a chance at a, at a pick six. Um, and then we can just run through the rest of these plays. Um, but there is a big hit that Jones does take on one of these, which pissed me off because, again, I just – what are you trying to accomplish here? There is no miracle in sight. Like, right there. What if he goes down awkwardly and something happens? Or what if Hudson gets – just, there's just nothing to gain here. Like, you're Speaking not scoring. Hits. <laughs> oh, yeah, Tanner exactly. Hudson gets laid out on I'm this play. About. Yeah. And then it's just like what it just makes to me no sense because I don't know what people think. I guess some people maybe think that you can score two touchdowns in a minute from your own 10. But the Giants are not moving the ball at all in this game. It's just it's just to me at some point you got to concede to protect your players from getting injured. You know, 100 percent. I mean, imagine losing Daniel Jones in a situation like this. It'd be yeah. terrible. And here, here's that twist I was talking about. Yeah, that. Yep that Josh Azudu that I was like, Oh man, Josh Azudu was so good picking up the twist, but this is when he allows the guy to kind of slip right past him. Yeah. He makes right. contact with him, but damn Nuosu, man, not a lot of people talk about him. He, he was drafted out of USC, I think round three, maybe round two Yeah, this was to the challenge. chargers by the chargers. And now he's a Seattle Seattle. Well, look, man, he dips that shoulder and just bends right through the contact and gets right into sack Daniel Jones. Yeah. He's smaller on the smaller side, but he was active in this game. What a, what a franchise altering trade it was for the Seahawks too, right? Like we talked about Shelby Harris, who was just a piece in that Broncos trade for Russell Wilson, a good piece who's played really well. And here's another example: Jones is going down to the ground. Get we just don't need, him. yeah, we just don't need him going to the ground in this situation and taking sacks and hits. But um, yeah, great trade by the Seahawks, made a big play. But let's let's get into some superlatives now, Nick. We'll wrap it up with some superlatives. It's not going to be pretty, but but we can do it anyway. All right, Nick, let's start with your unheralded player of the game unheralded player cheese man can everything just be andrew thomas now nah, i'll um dude he didn't do anything best route, right. andrew thomas best throw yeah. no no no. i was gonna go with lawrence cager but i'm gonna go with chris myrick who had to step into the shoes of being the number one blocking type of tight end even though tanner hudson kind of assumed the role that daniel bellinger had so i'm gonna go with chris myrick i feel like he adds a level of toughness that the other tight ends not named daniel bellinger don't have in terms of blocking and he had that nice catch on third down that was a conversion and he also made a couple of nice blocks. So yeah, let's go with Myrick. I think Myrick is the correct pick. Since you picked him, I won't pick him and I'll pick somebody else. Cajun didn't play enough snaps for me to go with him. I'm going to go with Darius Slayton. Yeah. Maybe you don't consider him unheralded, but he was one of the best players on the field this game. And he even had that, what we talked about those two routes later in the game, those vert routes where he could have scored touchdowns on, especially the double move that should have been a touchdown. So that would have been a 50 yarder. So he and he made some huge catches in traffic, he did not drop any passes, which fans want to kill him for when he does. So I'll give it to Slayton because he's not going to win my best player. So I, I want to give him some credit there. How about the best route on film from you? I think it's the best route on film is the out and up that wasn't targeted yeah. by Darius Slayton. And there yeah. were several that Darius Slayton, I think, ran. And we went over the one by Wandell Robinson just before. I got a lot of the best routes weren't maximized at all, weren't even used, I think. So a lot of the routes that were used were just deep curls. I think the one on the throw that you really liked that we're probably going to go over here in a second, that was a nice route by Darius Slayton. So that one could have made it, but it was just basically a deep curl. Find the soft spot behind the underneath the defender. Yep, exactly. And that's going to be my best route. That's the best route of the game, the out and up from Darius Slayton, where he just cooked the defender. Ball didn't go his way that time. Hopefully it goes his way in the future. 
Um, especially when there's no safety. Uh, anyway, best throw would be the throw I talked to that you that you kind of hinted at. It was right after the big conversion on the third and 14. Um, just a, a good job by Jones to slide, reset in the pocket, and really drive that ball. And as you see that underneath defender, who again had good depth, they had great depth all game, the Seahawks underneath uh, second level guys. But he tries to break on that, and there's just no time to break on it because the ball is just driven with good velocity. Yeah, my favorite throw would be that one and then the other one to Darius Slayton that we went over a couple plays before the one that yep. he drove in there. I think a lot of those throws on those deep curls against the cover two were well-placed by Daniel Jones with good velocity, able to step up in the pocket. Pocket was clean. So good job on those situations. Yep. All right. Best play call. Best play call. I like the tight end fade to... Lawrence Cager against that defense because if Lawrence Cager isn't covered. He's open. That's going to be a touchdown. You also have Saquon Barkley that you could throw the football to, even though he was much more of a decoy on that play, but you had the two backside routes, high lowing, you know, David Sills running the drag. And then you have the dig from Tanner Hudson who was open. It just wasn't thrown. So I'm going to go with that play. And I also like the fact that they're giving Lawrence Cager some looks because he has a level of explosiveness. And it's also somebody that you're not circling to game plan against. Yeah, for me, it would be that play, too. It's the red zone play where Hudson gets open. It's just so great. You got eye candy with Barkley running out there on the fake screen. You have so many, like, you see that second-level defender, and they did such a good job all game, the Seahawks, of dropping to the right depth and taking away passing lanes. He is fooled. He goes all the way out to protect there, which opens up that wide-open passing lane for Jones to throw to Hudson, but uh, he decides to run the ball, and so that would be my favorite play call, too. The only other one I might put in there. Yeah, go ahead. You also have the motion of Cager, which is huge. Because right. before the motion, you're just like, okay, I have Saquon Barkley. And then he motions, and then you call it right away. So you have the defense being like, okay, well, who am I have? I might switch switch up their assignments. Right. I think an, another excellent element that Mike Kafka has throughout much of his play design is just that quick motion, snap the football. Hopefully you create a miss or force a miscommunication. Yeah, I like how you broke that down. Okay, best player overall on film in this one. To me, it was yeah. a obvious yeah yeah there wasn't even anyone close to him barkley had a pretty good game um but no nowhere close to andrew thomas so that's an easy one andrew thomas pass blocking one through ten like pass blocking (laughs) one through ten i guess i'm gonna go with a 7.1 like is that like fair i I think like i I think it's i think the pass blocking was pretty good and it's just the giants couldn't do anything in terms of getting anybody open or taking advantage of the defense when there was someone open. It was right. really just a bunch of issues with this team to not be able, except for the protection, to not be able to move the football and yeah, uh, create any kind of offense. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off there. I was just going to say one thing that you brought up late in the pod that I thought was a really good observation, which is, you know, they should have adjusted at some point earlier to the depth that these second level defenders are dropping to and taking advantage of more check down type plays, get the ball in Barkley's hands, see what he can do. Um, Just something, because like you said, in this game, pass protection was not an issue. You rarely see a game ever in the NFL where you generate this few yards in the passing game, despite having really good pass protection. I don't want to say it was amazing, but it pretty much was. There were some like squeaky clean pockets that we just showed you. You guys saw it all. There were some misses by Tyree Phillips. There were some misses by Azudu. A couple of times Feliciano lost late, but for the most part, really good. I'm giving it a 7.5. Like this is pretty damn good pockets. Run blocking though, one through 10. That one will be a little lower. Yeah, run blocking one through 10. I'm going to go with... Let's go with a 2.9. I don't think it was great, but I also think a lot of it was just how good Seattle played the Giants rushing attack. It's not going to be the worst grade we're going to give out, but it definitely wasn't good, and there's a lot of room for improvement. Yeah, I'm going to go... It's tough because Hudson played a big role in, in lowering it for me, and I just didn't think they had much push up front. And and part of the reason I'm going with a low grade, I guess, Nick, would be just that, like we talked about earlier, there were a lot of too high looks from Seattle where you should be able to run the button. One other thing you said, which I thought was true, there wasn't really many stacked boxes from Seattle. So it was weird. I just Seattle played it so disciplined so well. Um, so I'll give it a 4.4. Uh, you know, given the circumstances, not a great effort from the Giants run blocking unit. Um, all right, that's all we have for on today's uh 
all 22 break down the Giants off in the film. Look, it wasn't our best tape. We know it wasn't the most fun to watch for you guys. I'm sure we want better than this too, but at least it was the first really ugly game on offense of the season. And we're in week eight, right? We can sign up for that eight games total from a giant after what we saw the last two seasons from this offense. I think you have to sign up for one of eight really ugly games on offense. That's fine. We're not, we need, we can't expect to be at the level where every single game looks pretty damn good on offense, right? We're not, we're not in one off season, so we'll get there. And I'm happy that it just happened in this one, and I hope they can fix it soon. But keep it locked and loaded on Big Blue Banter. Moving forward, you'll have defensive film podcast breakdown. We're going to have some other things potentially later in the week. It's the bye week. Um, and then next week, we have some fun content coming as well. So thank you so much. Make sure you like this video if you watched it. Hit subscribe. Please share it with your friends. All that good stuff. Otherwise, have a great rest of your week, and we'll talk to you soon.